It has a very easy URL to remember. It's math265.org. And so if you're thinking, oh, I need a website for Math265, what's the web address again? Just math265.org. Now, the reason I point this out is people ask, you know, what should I be studying? Where can I get problems? The best place to get problems are to go into the exams. And there's lots of places to look for problems. You've got the exams from this semester. There's great problems. Even the practice problems are pretty good. And if you scroll down, you can get to the final exams. And so uh, for many years, plus solutions, and most of them are correct. Occasionally, there's some which are wrong. Uh, a few other things to note, the lectures and notes. If you're like, well, I really wish I could go back and, and see a particular lecture, the answer is yes, you can. They're all there, including today. That'll be posted here. To find it, just click over here where it's playlist, and you scroll down, and you find your favorite one you want to watch. So it's all there. And a few things to be aware of. There are some extra reviews and office hours. So you came here, so at least you know about that one. The review sheet that you picked up and the practice problems are also online, so you can share them with your friends. The solutions aren't there yet because we haven't done them yet. But we'll do them, and those will be scanned in and posted as well. And then there's various office hours. And uh, if you need to get some reps in on Thursday, 12 to 2, go and do some reps with Dr. Shank, and uh, that'll be good. Know where your final exam is, so if you're not sure, it's on the website. And you just go and look it up. And it's not your classroom. So if you show up to your classroom and you're like, I'm not a psychology person, what's going on? Uh, you're in the wrong place. No, know the right place. Know the right place. OK, so just be aware of that useful resource, math265.org. And we'll start in just a moment here. Final exam, what, some things you might want to know about the final. Well, probably you should know these things already. There are seven problems. Now, it's a two-hour exam. And if you do the math, and after all, you are engineers, you can do that. Uh, seven problems, 120 minutes. That means you get 17 problems per minute plus one extra minute. And I recommend you use that one extra minute to do your panic right at the start. Just panic for one minute, get it out of the way, and then just be relaxed for the rest of the test. It makes it much simpler. No calculators are allowed. So rumors are swirling around. Are there calculators? Are there no calculators? The answer is no calculators. Now, this is to your advantage. It means that all the computations involved are easy. They have to be done with simple hand com computations. So there's no weird, like, multiply 124 by 272. No, no, nothing like that. It's more like add 3 and 7. That's the kind of computations that we're going to expect you to be able to do. Well, maybe a little bit more than adding 3 and 7. But the point is, nothing should be overly complicated. Now, this is a signal you can use. If you're at a point in the test, you're like, boy, this is getting really complicated. You should stop and say, hmm, I wonder if I've missed something or if I've made a mistake. It's better to stop and go back and, and find the mistake and then keep going than to say, you know what, forget it. I'll just keep going with this mistake because, gosh darn it, I like doing hard work and getting no points. So um, anyways, the problems are in a random order, which means that we're not going sequentially through the course. So it makes it a little bit harder because you don't know what a certain problem builds off. You can't say, oh, well, the previous problem was built off of maybe a gradient. So that means I'm post-gradient for this problem. No, no, they're com completely random. So one thing I'd recommend is perhaps if you choose not to do that one minute of panic, Use that one minute to actually look through the test and say, OK, what are the problems? What are the ideas I'm going to need? What techniques will I be using? Make that one minute a planning session. All right, perfectly fine, perfectly fine. There's no word problem. I know I was hoping to come up with a great word problem to celebrate the fact that uh, the final exam happens to coincide with the opening night of an, a highly anticipated movie. Yes, we all know what we're talking about. Ferdinand, which has John Cena starring as a bull uh, who doesn't want to fight. But at any rate, we didn't come up with a good word problem. But I think we came up with some good problems. So, so no word problem. 
Um, things that, so general life advice, how to do well. And this works for all finals, not just this final. Study, go to the review sessions, and don't do things passively. Ask questions. If you don't understand something, ask. Okay, why did you do that? It might be like, oh, we screwed up. Here's what we should have done. Or it's like, oh, here's what, here's what the idea is. Get enough sleep. I know you feel like there's a trade-off between sleep and, and, and more studying, but at some point, that goes against you. And I once had a, a, I think a Calc 1 or Calc 2 problem where it's like, well, you're trying to maximize your quiz scores and you're based it on how many of hours versus uh, studying hours versus how much sleep you have. Because it's absolutely true. If, if you fall asleep during the exam, you're not gonna get a lot of points. So make sure you get enough sleep. Read each problem carefully, follow the directions, check your work early, and check it often. Oftentimes, mistakes tend to happen near the start, so be extra careful at the start. Where do people tend to lose points? Um, I've been doing this for quite a long time. I have seen a lot of tests. I've graded a lot of tests. And roughly speaking, on Calc 3, there's three big areas people lose points on. Calculus, geometry, algebra slash arithmetic. And of the three, it's that algebra slash arithmetic which kills you. Kills you every time. You're not going to succeed if you aren't careful. All right. Well, uh, that's that. Any, any questions about the final? Attempts to extract information out of me. No? Okay. Usually somebody tries something, but all right. Well then, what are we doing today? So, if you go online, there's all those videos, and you can rewatch the whole course. It takes about 36 hours. If you're, you just want the Cliff Notes version, just watch the Dead Week class, which takes about, uh, I think, two and a half hours. Um, so you can look back and look at the material. I want to focus on how problems are solved. Now, we, we could have just scanned in a bunch of solutions, which we've done with the old finals, but I want to talk through what I'm thinking when I see a problem. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these 24 problems, and these 24 problems are going to highlight important ideas from the class. Now, will every problem be something similar on the exam? No, no, because the exam only has seven problems. There are things we're going to do today which are definitely not on the exam. But my goal is not to get you to pass this one exam. My goal is to get you to pass any exam. So I want you to understand all the material. Because at some point, you're going to look back and say, man, I really wish I understood such and such topic. Why didn't we review it at the end? Well, this is our chance. This is our chance. So we're going to do problems. It's going to take us a long time. It'll probably take us more than two hours. I booked the room for three hours. I said to two-ish. Feel free to leave at any time. I am not offended. It'll all be posted online. It'll be really easy. In fact, it'll be really nice because if you go onto the YouTube page, you can just jump right to a particular problem. All right, well, with that said, let's begin. Um, I guess suppose I should say one final note. Where did these problems come from? All over the place. Old exams, uh, a few showed up on quizzes, a few showed up on practice problems, and a couple of them were special just for today. So I'll, I'll tell you the story on, I think, number seven or eight. Great story about that. Okay, so here we go. Start with geometry. So the first few problems are going to be more geometrical. So we want to find the plane which contains two lines. So we're given two lines. And so we can tell that they're lines because they say the word line. So that's useful. But also we can tell that they're lines because these have the form of lines. In other words, a line is a point plus t times a direction. And I say, OK, well, that's fantastic. I want a plane which contains both those lines. Well, that should be easy because usually when I'm after a plane, the key here is normal. If I can find a normal vector, I'm going to get a plane. So fantastic, I think. All I have to do is find two directions. And I say, well, this is going to be super easy because I have two lines, and those lines have directions. So what do I do? Well, I, I look at my directions, and that's the part by the t. So the first line has direction 1, negative 2, 4, and the second line has direction 2, negative 4, 8, and I pause for a second, I say, there's something off about these two lines. Notice that these two vectors are parallel. 
In other words, if you look at 1, negative 2, 4, if you've multiplied everything by 2, you get 2, negative 4, 8. So these are not two separate directions. They're actually the same direction. So I cannot use these two to form the normal vector, because the normal vector, I need to have two different directions to start with. And then I cross them. If I take two vectors which point in the same direction I cross them, I'm going to get 0, which is not useful at all. So, all right, I need to come up with another plan. So what's our other plan? Well, I think about how we can find uh, vectors in the plane. And one way is we can look at points. Now, this point is in the plane. Here I have the point 3, 1, 2. And this point's in the plane, negative 2, negative 3, 3. So I say, aha, my plane contains these two points, 3, 1, 2, 2, negative 3, 3. And so I can make a vector that goes between them. Now you'll notice here I'm not being careful plotting the point exactly. We're going for intuition. Intuition is more important. We're not testing you on your ability to exactly mark points. We're testing our ability to understand things. So, okay, what's the vector that goes between them? Well, okay, go up by 1. Then I went up by 4. That's a big up. Then I went down by 1. 1, 4, negative 1. Now I have my other direction. So I have two directions. Now with two directions, I take the cross product. 1, negative 2, 4. Cross 1, 4, negative 1. And we know how to do cross products. They're important things. We often have to do cross products. So we've gone very good. I, J, K, first vector, second vector. Take that determinant. You can do cofactor expansion. I tend to go in the diagonals. Remember to wrap around. I times negative 2 times negative 1. 2i. J times 4 times 1. 4j. K times 1 times 4 is uh, 4k. Then I'll go the other direction. All right, going upwards. Uh, 1, negative 2k. That would be negative 2k, but because we went up, we're going to subtract negative 2k, which only means add 2k. 4, 4i. 16i, but we subtract. And minus 1, 1j. One that's minus j, but we subtract, so we really add j, which would give us our negative 14, 5, 6. Now, I am someone who was very paranoid about my abilities to do computations. So I always, whenever I do a, a cross product, I check, because I don't want to lose points. Now, one way to check is to redo the computation, but if you made a mistake, you're often likely to make the same mistake. So a better approach is to say, what's the property? Well, it's got to be perpendicular. So I'm just going to do a quick dot product to check. Minus 14, minus 10 is minus 24, plus 24, 0. Good. Minus 14, plus 20 is 6, minus 6, 0. Good. So this is definitely the right direction. This is my normal. Now that I have my normal, I can say, aha, my plane will be negative 14x plus 5y plus 6z. Because remember, the normal gives you those coefficients in front of x, y, and z. And that's got to equal something. Well, how do I find the something? The answer is I pick a point. I actually have these two points. Um, I could find other points to plug in. I could, for example, pick any point on the line. But why, why go through the work to find new points if you already have points? So plug in 3, 1, 2. Uh, so you'd have negative 42 plus 5 plus 12. Well, negative 42 plus 12 is negative 30. Uh, plus 5 more will give us negative 25. And so final answer, negative 14x plus 5y plus 6z is negative 25. Ah, nice warm-up. Good warm-up. OK. Any, any questions? All right. Well, one down and uh, 23 to go. Let's go to number two. Find the line which passes through the point 2, 1, 4 is parallel to the plane 4x plus 5z equals 19 plus 3y and intersects the z-axis. Now, here, this is an interesting problem. Because we're after a line. Now, a line has two pieces to it. A line has a direction and a point. Well, we've already got the point. So good. We're halfway done. 
We've barely even started and we're halfway there. So we've got to focus on the direction. Now we know it's going to be parallel to this plane. Now this plane has been written in a strange way. So oftentimes, if they write something in an unusual way, just say, well, here, let me rewrite it for you. So we'll rewrite it. That would be 4x minus 3y plus 5z equals 19. Okay, and it's really, really a, a reasonable thing to do because in this way we can say, aha, the normal for this plane, 4, negative 3, 5. Now, what do we do with that? Is that the direction of the line? No, because the line isn't perpendicular to the plane. The line is parallel to the plane. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us the following thing. This here, this 4, negative 3, 5, that has to be perpendicular to the direction of the line. So now I have something which is perpendicular to the direction of my line. But I haven't actually found my line yet. I don't, haven't found the direction yet. Um, how do we find it? Well, you have to make sure you use the information. And we've talked about the point. We're going to use that to make our line. We've talked about the fact we're parallel to the plane. But we haven't used this third piece yet. It intersects the z-axis. So what's that saying is if I come over here, I've got this point 2, 1, 4. I've got this plane sitting somewhere in space. And then I'm going to intersect the z-axis somewhere. And so I'm going to intersect the z-axis. Now the z-axis, what does that look like? Well, all the points look like 0, 0, something. So the z-axis, x equals 0, y equals 0, and z is something. So I say, OK, well, I don't know what that a is. If I did, I'd be done. But I do know that my direction of the line I can write in the following way. If I go, say, 2, 1, 4 to 0, 0, a, that would be what? That would be negative 2, negative 1, and negative 4 plus a. Now that's, that's our vector. So this is our direction of our line for some a. We don't know a. But now we say, wait a second, hold on. We can figure it out. Because we know it's perpendicular to this line, two things are perpendicular if dot product is 0. So if I take this dot, 4, negative 3, 5, that's got to equal 0. Well, so negative 8 plus 3, doing our dot product, we'll do a lot of dot products today, and then it's minus 20 plus 5a. Better be equal to 0. Negative 8 plus 3 minus 20 is negative 25. Move to the other side, that says 5a equals 25 which says a equals 5. And now we're basically done because what? Now that I know a, I can put it back into there. That was the direction of the line. So our direction becomes negative 2, negative 1, and 1. Negative 4 plus 5. So now I have my direction, and I already have my point. So I put them together. And I'll do parametric. I like parametric. x equals y equals z equals 2, 1, 4. My point, 2, 1, 4. Then plus t times negative 2. And t times negative 1. And t times 1, which I'll just suppress. And I'll just go ahead and leave it like that. All right. Good. Uh, fun problems. I like geometry problems. They're a lot of fun. Okay, number three, number three. Find the length the particle travels along the curve t squared sine t, 137 minus t squared cosine t, and t squared plus e to the pi. Now, I'm pretty sure I wrote this problem because it has the number 137. Uh, at one point, students were convinced that if they ever saw the number 137, it must be Professor Butler involved. So maybe, maybe. Of course, 137 shows up in many popular uh, places. So I'm not responsible for all of them. So if I want to find the length of particle travels, I say, OK, there's a formula for that. Now, there's actually two ways to think of that. If I think of this as r of t, I could say, well, it's integral a to b of magnitude r prime of t, because magnitude of r prime is speed. You integrate speed, you get distance. 
or if you work that out, it's really the integral from a to b of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared plus z prime of t squared dt. So there we go. We have our formula. Well, they're the same thing, so let's go ahead and start working this out. So this will be the integral from 1 to square root of 8, and that's an unusual bound square root of 8. We'll see why, hopefully later, x prime of t squared. Well, x prime of t, that's your x of t. So I take the derivative, you've got to use the product rule. So what's that? Well, uh, the first times the derivative of the second, t squared cosine t, plus the derivative of the first times the second, 2t sine t. All right, squared. And y prime squared? All right, well, what will that be? Well, the 137 goes away, constant. Okay, then the first will be negative t squared times root of cosine. Well, root of cosine is negative sine, so it becomes t squared sine t, and then the root of the first, negative 2t cosine t squared. And now, thank goodness we have a lot of room here, it's a long to write it down, derivative with respect to z. Derivative of t squared is 2t, and derivative of e to the pi is 0, yeah. Oftentimes we throw in these funny constants just to make sure you remember, hey, funny constants are still constants. So we get 0. Now, one of the things we sometimes do is throw these problems in to check, okay, do you remember your algebra skills? We do expect you to know your basics. Basics are important. So make sure you know things like how to expand things out, how to factor, and later on we'll talk about how to solve systems of equations. So this is a good chance to really flex our expansion. Time to expand. So we're going to get t to the fourth cosine squared plus the cross terms. So I'm going to multiply these together and double. So that'll be 4t cubed cosine t sine t, and I'm going to square that, 4t squared sine squared. All right, that's the first term. The next term, very similar, but t to the fourth sine squared, then the cross terms, so double that, so that's going to be minus 4t cubed cosine t sine t, and then square the last term, 4t squared cosine squared, and I have to add the last piece in, 4t squared, dt. All right, barely squeezed in. But we made it, we made it. Now, this is our chance to test, well, did we do things right? Because if we do things right, things should become beautiful. We get some cancellation, because here's a plus, there's a minus. We also get some combinations. There's a t to the fourth cosine squared and a t to the fourth sine squared. That just becomes t to the fourth. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. That's one you should know. If you ever decide to get a math tattoo, that's a good one to start with. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. But why? You've, it's already tattooed on your heart. You know, you've got it memorized. Okay. So, what does this become? Well, 1 to square root of 8 of square root. I have t to the fourth. Then I'm going to have what? Well, 4t squared plus 4t squared, which means 8t squared dt. All right, so that's what we have. Now what do we do? We have to integrate it. And remember, we're not asking you to do complicated integrals, so there must be something you can do. Uh, anyone have suggestions? Yeah, you can factor. You'll notice everything has a t squared. You can factor t squared and then take the square root of t squared. So this becomes the integral 1 to square root of 8 of t square root t squared plus 8. It's almost like we wanted something nice to happen, because we did. And from here, now we can do substitution. And substitution is something we do expect you to be able to do. So if we let u equal t squared plus 8, then we see that du be 2t dt. Well, I have a t already, so I'll put a 2 here, and I'll put a half in front. Now I have my 2t ready to go. And I say, aha, this looks great. Now I'm going to update. I have the half out here. The 2t dt will become my du. 
square root of t squared plus h becomes square root of u, but because I'm doing calculus, I don't use square root, I say u to the one half. And then I remember I got update bounds because here in the original, these are really not just one to eight, this is really t equals one to t equals square root of eight. Sorry, I said one to eight, but I meant one to square root of eight. And over here, these are gonna be u bounds, u equals something to u equals something. This is gonna be an important theme when we hit integration in an hour or so. So I gotta update the bounds. So I plug in t equals one, one squared plus eight, nine, plug in square root of eight, square root of eight squared, that's eight, plus eight gives 16. And now I say, aha, so that's why we had square root of eight, because we got a nice number at this point. So we integrate, so that's one half times something, times u to the three halves, and now we say to that something, we, we flip this exponent two thirds, and we're gonna evaluate from nine to 16, the twos cancel, so this is one third times 16 to the three halves, minus nine to the three halves. Well, 16 to the three halves is also known as 64, and nine to the three halves is also known as 27, if you're wondering how to get that, if I take something to three halves, you can think of it as first take a square root and then cube. Square root of 16 is four, four cubed is 64. 64 minus 27, well, that's something that we should be able to do in our heads, uh, but we can also just write it down, that's 37, and we have time, we don't have to rush. So, final answer, 37 thirds. Good. That's number three, arc length. Well, keeping in curves, let's go on and start number four. So suppose you have the following curve, r of t, and it's parameterized, 2t cubed plus 3t squared. Uh, 2t cubed is in the x direction, 3t squared is in the y direction, and 3t in the z direction. And we want to find a sub t and a sub n. Now, that says what? Well, we want to talk about the way to decompose acceleration. So acceleration is a, a function, and we can rewrite it as a sub t times t and a sub n times n. Where what? Well, these are various numbers. Now, there's two ways to find a sub t. One way is take the derivative of the magnitude of r prime, and the other way is to take r prime dot r double prime over the magnitude of r prime. These turn out to be the same. Essentially, this is a projection. This goes back, if you look at the way we actually talked about decomposing acceleration, uh, this is, uh, pops up from our discussion. Now, a sub n, how do we find that? Well, there's two ways. You can take r prime cross r double prime, take that magnitude, divide by magnitude of r prime, or, you say, you know, after I found a sub t, it turns out that if you take a sub t squared plus a sub n squared, it's the same as the magnitude of a squared. It sounds kind of like the Pythagorean theorem because it is the Pythagorean theorem. That's exactly where it's coming from. So, there we go. Now, depends how you want to do it. Suppose you wanted to do it for time because I don't know, maybe you're stressed, and you just want to get through the test as soon as possible. You got your 915 tickets in your pocket to go see Ferdinand. You don't want to be late. You want to make sure you get those good seats. Uh, no, 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 come on. We're not going to see Ferdinand. Okay. Uh, but suppose you wanted to do it quick. Well, if you're doing it quick, I'd recommend using the derivative and using this relationship because you can completely now avoid things such as you don't need to compute the second, uh, well, you do need to compute the second derivative, but you don't need to take a dot product or a cross product. So if you take r prime of t, what is that? Well, take the derivative of each piece. That's 6t squared i plus 6t j plus 3k. So the magnitude of r prime of t is the square root of 6t squared squared plus 6t squared plus 3 squared. That's a lot of stuff that's squared there. That's 36 t to the fourth plus 36 t squared plus 9. 
Now, you should be comfortable with doing things such as factoring out things which are common. So obviously they all have 9 in common, so you should pull that out. So 9 times 4t to the 4th plus 4t squared plus 1. And you should also be highly suspicious that we've chosen nice curves where things have beautiful factorizations and that there's lots of things where I have a square inside of a square root. So you should suspect that that's the case. And given that we suspect that, we might think that this is 2t squared plus 1 quantity squared. Well, we might think that's true because it is true. So that's good. That's a good reason why we think that way. So this becomes 3 times 2t squared plus 1, or if you like, 6t squared plus 3. Okay, now on a side note, what is our double prime? Well, just take the second derivative. That would be 12ti plus 6, j plus 0k. And if I take the magnitude of our double prime of t, that would be the square root of 144t squared plus 36 plus 0, because I'm just squaring each term. All right. Well, not much that you can really simplify here, but uh, we'll leave that as is. Okay, so here we go. Quick way to do it. All right, so what is a sub t? Well, it is the derivative of 6t squared plus 3, which is, anyone, anyone, anyone? 12t. And we're done with that part. How about a sub n? Well, we now have 12t squared plus a sub n squared is equal to this squared, 144t squared plus 36. Well, notice that 12t squared happens to be 144t squared. So we get some cancellation. a sub n squared is 36, or a sub n is 6. And a sub n is always positive. So, and now we're done. Finished. Do you want to do it the slow way? Are you satisfied? Okay, people seem to be somewhat indifferent. So, given that we have lots of problems and we're only on problem four, we will move on. If you'd like to see the slow way, you can come talk to me later. Okay, here's a fun one. Now we're moving tangent. Okay, so now we're starting to get into derivatives. Find the value d so that 7x plus 6y minus 2z equals d is tangent to the surface z equals f of xy equals x squared minus xy plus 3y squared plus 2x plus y plus 1 fourth. Now, what's going on here? Well, the 7x plus 6y minus 2z equals d, if you pick a value for d, that's a plane. It's, it's a plane for every choice of d. What's happening here is that you've got several possibilities. So you have a plane. As you move d, you're basically moving what the plane is. You're doing a translation. So it's sort of like, okay, how do we translate the plane up and down to just that sweet spot, that one spot where it's going to be tangent? So we have to start thinking about things. So we have to think, okay, so more or less, our, our idea here is we want this to be tangent. So it should be acting like a, a, a tangent plane. So that's what we want. We want this to be a tangent plane. So how do we make it behave like a tangent plane? Well, let's think about what a tangent plane looks like. So if you remember a tangent plane, it tends to have the following. It looks like the following. Z equals F of AB plus F sub X of AB times X minus A plus F sub Y of AB times Y minus B. Or Another way to say this is z equals f sub x of ab times x plus f sub y of ab times y plus stuff. And this is a constant, which is something to be determined. Well, that stuff is essentially that would correspond almost roughly to the d. It's, it's some constant. So I say, OK, hold on a second. Well, let's think about what this plane looks like. I'm going to rewrite it, and I'm going to solve for z. So if I solve that plane for z, uh, let's see, I would start by saying 2z 
would be equal to 7x plus 6y minus d, or z should equal 7 halves x plus 3y uh, plus stuff. Okay, figure out what that stuff is later. Now, here's the key insight. Here's the key insight. It's like, hold on. If I want these to match, this, whoops, I should probably choose a, a color of green that will show up. If I want these to match, this 7 halves, did I choose the same color of green? I feel like it feels like it. All right. Better match up with that F sub X. And this 3 here better match up with this F sub Y. So if I want this plane to, to touch, I've got to make sure that my partial derivatives match up with the correct values so that I'm, I'm going to have everything work out. Okay, so this is a good thing. This gives us a plan. So now we can rephrase this. It's like, all right, we need the following. We need F sub X at some point AB to be equal to 7 halves, and we need F sub Y at AB to also be equal to 3. If I can figure that out, what, I'm, what that will do for me is it'll tell me where my point of tangency occurs. And once I know where my point of tangency is, I have a point. That's the thing I'm missing on my plane. Because my plane, I need two things. I need a direction and a point. And the direction gives me the coefficient. So I've already had the direction, but I needed a point to lock it into place. So that's what we're after. We're after a point here. Well, so let's take our, our derivatives. So here we go. So I'm going to take, take our derivatives. F sub x is uh, 2x minus y uh, plus 2. And that's going to equal 7 halves. And f sub y, OK, what would that be? That would be minus y plus 6y plus 1. That's got to equal 3. OK, so now we come to one of our fun things we do, two equations two unknowns. And this is something that you can expect you'll see at least once and possibly more than once. So you should be comfortable with doing this. And there's lots of ways to do this. One thing you can do is you can solve. And uh, another thing you can do is realize that you, you screwed up and fix your mistake. There you go. That's supposed to be a minus x because I'm taking derivative of minus xy with respect to y. OK. But anyway, so as I was saying, you can usually look for some kind of substitution. You can look for some combination of the two to, to combine together to let you solve. Occasionally, you can just solve it outright. So there's lots of ways to do these things. One other thing to look for, my favorite thing is factoring. And we'll probably talk about that later. In this case, what I, I would probably do here is if I multiply the second equation by 2 and I combined, what would happen? Well, 2x and minus 2x would give me no x's. They'd cancel. Minus y plus 12y, that would give me 11y. 2 plus 2 would give me 4. Then I'd have 7 halves plus 3 uh, times 2. Is that 7 halves plus 6? Well, I'll be careful here and write that 7 halves plus 6. Now, 6 can also be rewritten. This is 11y equals 7 halves plus 12 halves minus 8 halves. OK, because I'm subtract 4. So if I do that, 7 plus 12 is 19 minus 8 gives us 11 halves. So 11y equals 11 halves. Well, that's awfully convenient. So what is y? Yeah, so y equals a half. OK, so this is, this is we've identified the y coordinate, where our point of tangency is. Now, how about x? Well, just pick an equation. I'll pick this equation here. So if I plug this in, I'm going to have minus x plus 3 plus 1 equals 3, because I put in y equals a half. 3's cancel, and I get x equals 1. So y equals a half, x equals 1. This is where my point of tangency occurs. Now, to finish it off, I need a third coordinate, because that's my x and my y. I need my z. Well, that's not bad. My z is what? I need z to equal f of 1 comma a half. Well, so let's go through and work it out. x equals 1, so that's 1 squared 
minus x times y, so minus a half, plus 3 times a half squared, that's 3 fourths, plus 2 times x, which is 2, plus y, which is a half, plus a fourth. Well, the halves cancel. And let's see, what else do I have? I have 3 fourths plus 1 fourths is 1, plus 1, plus 2. So that's 4. All right. So I now have no space left on this page. OK, but that's all right. We'll, we'll just cram it in. All right, so the point on our plane is the following. 1 half 4. 1, 1 half 4. Well, how do I finally finish this by solving for d? I plug it into the plane. So what do I get? I'm going to get 7 times 1 plus 6 times a half minus 2 times 4 minus 8 equals 2. There's our answer. D equals 2. On, on a side note, one of my suggestions I have if you read through the review sheet is uh, you should do things such as circle your answer. And uh, I also have some other pieces of, of advice, things such as uh, don't make mistakes. It's a, it's a very useful thing. Avoid making mistakes. But anyways, also make sure you show your work. We can only grade you on what you wrote down. We can't grade you on what you thought. Uh, we, ha we have not been able to figure out how to do that yet. OK. So other than I was terribly disorganized, this is the right process. Any questions on this one? Cool. All right. Now, number six. Ah, this is a great story. So you probably know that two years ago, fall 15, there were only seven problems on the final. You're probably thinking, why? Because every other final before now has had eight. Why were there only seven problems on fall 15? And the answer is because eight problems were written, and uh, all but one faculty member really hated this problem. They said, ah, students can't handle this. And I, and I said, OK, we'll compromise. We'll throw it out. But that was two years ago. Our students have gone better. Our faculty have gone more excited. Um, uh, Dr. Shank apparently is described now as being squirrel-like in his movements and actions. So, so we're ready. We can handle these types of problems now. So let's do it. So, so suppose you have a function. It's a function of s and t. So you have g of st is equal to f of 2s two two minus t plus 1 and s plus t plus 2 where f of xy is a differentiable function. That's what we're given. And we're given the tangent plane to g of st at the point 2, 1. Happens to be z equals 4s minus 5t plus 4. And we want to find the tangent plane to f of xy at 4, 5 in the form z equals ax plus by plus c. All right. Well, what does this mean? Well, we need to get some information about our various pieces here. Well, let's take a note of things. Now, 4, 5 is not just randomly chosen. Uh, for instance, let's take a look at g of 2 comma 1. If I look at g of 2 comma 1, that's equal to f of what? Well, it would be 2, because I'm oh, sorry, 2 times 2, minus 1, plus 1, comma 2, plus 1, plus 2, which is equal to f of 4 comma 5. If I could write 5 correctly, there we go. So g of 2, 1 is the same as f of 4, 5. So, so it's actually kind of, kind of makes sense that there's a connection. Now the question is, how do I find g of 2 and 1? And the answer is, look at the tangent plane. Now because the tangent plane stores three pieces of information. It stores the value of the function, the value of the partial derivative with respect to the first variable, and the value of the partial derivative with respect to the second variable. So what I can do is if I plug in s equals 2 and t equals 1 into this tangent plane, I'm going to get the following. So this is equal to 4 times 2 
minus 5 times 1 plus 4, which is going to be, okay, 8 plus 4 is 12, minus 5 is 7. So now I know f of 4, 5 is 7. Okay, that's one of the things I'm going to need to know if I'm going to make a tangent plane. But that's not the only thing that I need to know. I also need to know partial derivatives. So for that, let's think about what's happening here. What we have here is that we really have that, that g here is a function f, which just depends on x and y, and x depends on s and t, and y depends on s and t. So what we have is our, our setup, we can talk about the chain rule. This is a chain rule problem. So what do we do? Well, let's compute g sub s. According to the rule, g sub s will be partial f, partial x, so that's f sub x times partial x, partial s. All right, that's just partial x, partial s, plus f sub y, partial y, partial s. Now that's just generic. Uh, let's go ahead and, and fill in our details. So what does this say? Well, it says g sub s at 2 comma 1 would be equal to f sub x at where? Well, it's going to be equal to f sub x at 4 comma 5, because there's this same relationship. This, this 2, 1, and 4, 5 always go together. When s and t are 2, 1, x and y are 4 and 5, times partial x, partial s. Well, what is partial x, partial s? The answer is 2. Take the derivative of the x piece with respect to s, plus f sub y, 4 comma 5, times partial y partial s, which is 1. Now, do we know what g sub s at 2 comma 1 is? And the answer is yes. Why? Because we have the tangent plane. The tangent plane contains that information. That's equal to 4, that coefficient. All right, now let's do the same thing, but with respect to t. Now, if you do the same thing with respect to t, you'll see it essentially is the exact same formulas. So f sub x, partial x, partial t, f sub y, partial y, partial t, and now you plug these points in, 2, 1, that's equal to f sub x at 4, 5. The only thing that's changing is our partials. So here's partial x, partial t is minus 1, and then on the second piece, it's f y, 4, 5, partial y, partial t is, oh, it turns out still 1, and that's going to equal to negative 5, because we can read that off from the tangent plane. So we now have the following. Two equations, two unknowns. 2 times f sub x, 4, 5, plus f sub y, 4, 5, equals 4, and minus f sub x, 4, 5, plus f sub y, 4, 5, equals negative 5. And what do we do? Well, we two equations, two unknowns. Now, in this case, if you subtract, you'll see I get 2 minus minus is 3. f sub x at 4, 5. Subtract, those cancel. 4 minus minus 5 is 9. So I get f sub x at 4, 5 is equal to 3. Once I know that, I can go ahead and plug that back in. So I, using that information, I get 6 plus f sub y at 4, 5 equals 4. So f sub y at 4, 5 equals negative 2. All right, we now have the function at 4, 5, the first derivative with respect to x at 4, 5, and the first derivative with respect to y at 4, 5. Everything that you possibly need to find a tangent plane, so now we can write down our tangent plane. Z should be equal to f 4, 5 plus f sub x 4, 5 times x minus 4 plus f sub y at 4, 5 times y minus 5, which, plug things in, that's 7, that's 3, and that's negative 2. So z equals 7 plus 3 times x minus 4, I'll go ahead and multiply this out, 3x minus 12, negative 2 times y minus 5, that's negative 2y plus 10. Or, finish it off, we get z equals 3x minus 2y, 
And now 7 plus 10 is 17, minus 12 is 5. 3x minus 2y plus 5, done. Beautiful, beautiful. I don't know why they didn't want that problem. That's crazy. That's crazy. All right. But anyways, the ideas are not bad. Don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Any questions on this one? I like this one. Not my favorite one, but it's up there. Okay. Now, number seven. Find the rate of change of f of x, y, z equals x squared z plus log of x, y squared plus z cubed at the point 1, 1, 1 in the direction negative 4, 7, 4. So, what kind of tools are we going to have? So one of the things you should start thinking of is how are you going to recognize what kind of problem you're doing? So, I mean, it's not enough to say, oh, I'm doing a Calc 3 problem. You've got to be a lot more specific. Now, there's a few things that are going on here. The phrase rate of change is another way of saying a derivative. The word direction is suggestive that you're finding a derivative in a given direction, or, another way to say this, this is a directional derivative. Okay, now we know what we're doing. We're doing a directional derivative. Now that we know what we're doing, we say, what's the rule? Well, the directional derivative in a given direction u of some function f at a point p is found by taking the gradient of f, evaluate at p dot that direction. And when we say that direction, we represent direction with a unit vector. So here we say, great, what do we need to do? We need to take the gradient, we need to evaluate the gradient, and we need to find the unit vector that corresponds to our direction, and we need to dot them together. So now we have a plan. So we start our plan. Now, one thing we might say is, before we jump in and start taking derivatives, ask yourself, can I simplify the function? In this case, you'll notice that we can. This is the same as x squared z. And log says, once you have a bunch of stuff multiplying together, you just pull it apart. So this is x squared z plus log x plus 2 log y plus 3 log z. Same function. That just might help us simplify when we're taking our derivatives. So gradient of f. Collect the partial derivatives. Take derivative with respect to x. That'll be 2xz, 1 over x. And the other two terms don't depend on x, so there's 0. Comma. Take derivative with respect to y. Well, there's no y, no y, 2 over y. And then the third term doesn't have a y. OK, derivative with respect to z, x squared, no z, no z, and then 3 over z. All right, so there's my gradient of f. I need to evaluate it at my point. So gradient of f at 1, 1, 1 would be 2 plus 1 is 3. 2 over 1 is 2. 1 plus 3 is 4. 3, 2, 4. So now I know that this is 3, 2, 4. OK, I've got to find u. Now there's no vector given, so this means we have to figure out the vector. I know where I'm at. I'm at 1, 1, 1. I know which direction I want. I want to go to. Oh, whoops. They gave me a direction. Ha. Normally, they give me a point and two points. Now, is this u? What's wrong with this? Yeah, it's not unit. OK, let's make a unit vector. So we're going to take the magnitude. So first thing is if it's not a unit vector, figure out its length. So this is going to be the square root of negative 4 squared is 16 plus 49 plus 16. 16 plus 49 plus 16, uh, that's 32 plus 49, which is 81. Which can also be written as 9. So that means that u, our unit vector, we just take the vector given and we scale by 1 ninth. So 1 ninth, negative 4, 7, Four. So there's our u. Now we take the dot product. All right, so our answer, directional derivative, 3, 2, 4, dot 1 ninth, negative 4, 7, 4. So this is something over 9. So 3 times negative 4, 
12, yep, we've got to get good at our dot products. 2 times 7, oh, sorry, that's negative 12. 2 times 7, 14. 4 times 4 is 16. 14 plus 16 is 30. 30 minus 12 is 18. 18 over 9 is 2. And we're done. Rate of change is 2. Okay, you'll see that oftentimes you get some really nice answers. That's because we chose things carefully. If you ever see a problem that says, simplify your answer, that means that it's particularly nice. Particularly nice. And so if you get a really ugly expression at the end, you should be suspicious that you did something wrong. All right, well, that was the last problem. We used the gradient to take the directional derivative. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about properties of the gradient. So here we go. Suppose you have a function f of x, y, z equals x squared y cubed z plus 5z squared. And we're at the point negative 2, 1, negative 1. And we want to find a unit vector pointing in the direction in which f increases most rapidly. And also find the rate of change for f in this direction. Now here, the, the key is increase most rapidly. So we have one particular thing where we talked about it goes in the direction and it, of most rapid increase. And so that tells us this is a property of the gradient. So this is a gradient question. We also knew it was a gradient question because I said we're going to do a gradient question. But we should, we should recognize, we should recognize when things are going to be done. All right, so what do we know? Well, the, the direction of the gradient is the direction of most rapid increase. The magnitude of the gradient is the rate or the amount of most rapid increase. So here we go. We're going to start by talking about the gradient of f. So that, remember, gradient of f, we've got our partial derivatives. f sub x, f sub y, f sub z. And so we take our partial derivatives. We get 2x y cubed z, comma, 3x squared y squared z, comma, x squared y cubed plus 10z. Now we evaluate at our point. Gradient of f at the point negative 2, 1, negative 1. What will that give us? Well, so mostly we just have to care about our sign. Be careful. So we have 2 times negative 2 times 1 times negative 1. So if we put that together, we're going to get 4, comma, 3 times 4 times 1 times negative 1. That'll give us negative 12, comma, 4 times 1, which is 4, plus 10 minus 1, uh, that's 4 minus 10, which is minus 6. All right, so that's our gradient. Now we have to be careful because we see here the word unit. So if you see the word unit, you better make sure you use the fact that it's a unit vector. This obviously is not. It's way too long. So we're going to take the magnitude of the gradient. So the magnitude of our gradient here, that's the square root of 16 plus 144 plus 36. Now if you add all these up, you'll get the square root of 196. Now this, I will say, was back in the day when it was cool to bring calculators to exams. Now, we probably wouldn't ask you to do the square root of 196, but does anybody know what it is? Yeah, oh, well, maybe we should start putting the square root of 196 on these problems. Uh, you guys are good. It is 14. Now, so notice, this is actually part of our answer. Because there's two pieces. You have to find a vector and the rate of change. So 14, that's our rate of change. So that answers the second part. And for the first part, to find the unit vector, we're going to take 1 over 14 times 4, negative 12, negative 6. This is perfectly fine. You'll notice that the problem, the test says, look, if it doesn't ask you to simplify, you don't have to simplify. Now, you could simplify. There's one thing you could do is you could take the 14 through. 4 over 14 becomes 2 over 7. Negative 12 over 14 becomes negative 6 over 7. And negative 6 over 14 becomes negative 3 over 7. So you could do that. I forgot to mention this. I should have. 
I will say that I did sneak the first page in of the final, no surprises, but uh, you'll see that there's particular things it says. Answer each question completely. You do not need to simplify your answers unless otherwise indicated. So these are the fairly standard, standard things. Nothing surprising there. So look, if you don't have to simplify and you're not comfortable, go ahead. I have seen people get the right answer, start simplifying, make one of those dangerous arithmetic mistakes, and lose points. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to lose points. You want all the points. All the points. Number nine. The surface is xz to the fourth minus x cubed y squared plus 2yz equals 2. And 3x squared z minus yz cubed minus x squared y squared equals 1. Both path through the point 1, 1, 1. Find the line tangent to both surfaces at that point 1, 1, 1. So we're asked to find a line. And so we need a, a point in a direction. Aha! Good news, they already gave us the point. We're halfway done. Ah, happy days, happy days. Now what we don't have, we don't have the direction. Now, what we think is we say, okay, it's gotta be tangent to these surfaces. In particular, note that this line has to be in both tangent planes. Because if it's tangent to the surface, if a line is tangent to a surface, that really says it's in the tangent plane. I know how to spell planes. There we go. So, so we know that our, our line is inside our tangent planes. Say, so, okay, well, let's use that information. So we want to sort of get some information about the tangent planes. One thing that this says is that the direction of the line has to be perpendicular to the normal vector for the tangent planes. So this is the key insight. So this is the geometrical reasoning. It says, aha, how do we find the direction? We think about things it has to be perpendicular to. That's a really common way to think about finding direction of objects. So probably our first step, if we're going to solve this problem, is let's think about how do we find the normals to these tangent planes. Well, in this case, we're in a really nice scenario. So if you ever have f of x, y, z equal to something, let's say some constant k, and you want to find the, the normal vector to that, well, the key here is that the gradient of f is going to be the normal to the tangent plane. So that tells us that actually getting those normals are easy as computing these gradients. So we're going to do that. So if I think of this first piece here, maybe that's my, my f, and I look at the gradient of f, that would be what? Well, take the with respect to x, that would be z to the fourth, minus 3x squared y squared, comma. Uh, then I have minus 2x cubed y plus 2z, comma. And then I have 4xz cubed and uh, 2y. And I evaluate at the point 1, 1, 1. So 1, 1, 1 is a very popular place to evaluate things because it's easy to evaluate. 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. 4 plus 2 is 6. Then I do the same thing for the second one. Think of that as g, gradient of g. Well, what would that be? Well, that would be 6xz uh, minus 2xy squared, comma, minus z cubed, minus 2x squared y, comma, and then 3x squared minus 3yz squared. Evaluate again at 1, 1, 1, and we're going to get 6 minus 2 is 4, minus 1 minus 2 is minus 3, 3 minus 3 is 0. So now I have my two normal vectors, and finally to get the direction for the line, I want to cross them. Crossing the two vectors gives me something perpendicular to both. So the direction is going to be negative 2, 0, 6, cross 4, negative 3, 0. That's i, j, k, negative 2, 0, 6, 4, negative 3, 0. All right, so that's 0i plus 24j 
and plus 6k, going the other direction, uh, that's going to be 0k, subtract, and it's uh, minus 18i, because we've gone the other direction, it's add 18i, and then we're going to be 0j. And so we put this all together, we're going to get 18, 24, 6, oops, I ran out of space there. Let's try it again, 18, 24, 6. All right, now we're paranoid, so we check. Negative 36 plus 36, 0. 18 times 4 is 72. 3 times 24 is 72, so 72 minus 72 is 0. So that's good. So this is the right, right direction. So now that you have the line, you can just put the pieces together. X equals Y equals Z equals, we know the point, 1, 1, 1. And then we have 18T, 24T, and 6T. Now, that's a perfectly fine answer. Another thing you can do is realize, hey, hold on a second. I can scale my direction by any amount. So all these have uh, 18, 24, and 6. They're all multiples of 6. So you could have just as well said, I want x equals 1 plus 3t, y equals 1 plus 4t, and z equals 1 plus t. It's the exact same line. And for that answer, you would get the exact same points. And so they're both fine. They're both fine. All right. Whew. There we go. Number nine. Up to double digits. Yeah. It's only taken us an hour to get through nine problems. Only 15 to go. Yeah, I think we might be over two hours. That's all right. As I said, feel free to leave any time. Uh, I'm, I'm not easily offended. At least, so I say. Oh, this is a good one. An oldie but a goodie. Find and classify. We love these problems. This is getting into our optimization stem. We're going to do several optimization problems here. So here, we want to find and classify all critical points of a particular function. So there's two phases. We start with the find phase. So the find phase says, look for where your partial derivatives are equal to zero. Now, really, critical points, there, there are, there's two schools of thought. One school of thought says critical points are where derivatives are, in our case, because we're multivariable calculus, gradient is zero. In general, I like to say critical points are the important points, points which are critical. In other words, where maximums occur. That tends to be things where gradient is zero, gradient is undefined, or boundary points. And we'll get into some of those in a little bit with an additional problem. But for right now, if it just says find and classify, focus on when does the gradient equal zero? Because that's the only place we can talk about classification. Okay, so f sub x, well, that would be what? Well, 4x cubed minus 4y minus 14x plus 4 equals 0. All right, because we want it to equal 0. Uh, here we go to the next one, f sub y. That would be minus 4x. And that's not any y, so plus 8y. Good. And minus 8 equals 0. Okay, so now we have two equations and two unknowns. So the things you should look for are substitutions to make and factoring. One of those two things will happen. And if neither of those two things happen, either there's been a really, really bad mistake on the way the test was written, or you've made a mistake. 99% um, of the time, hopefully, it's that you made a mistake, because, boy, if we ever really make a mistake, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. But okay, so here, I don't see any easy way to factor anything. So I'm going to think of substitution. Now in the second equation, I see that I can easily solve for x or y. So I have to make a choice. Do I solve for x or do I solve for y? Now in essence, neither choice is wrong. However, one choice might be easier. The reason I say that is just think about the process. If you solve for x in terms of y, you're going to have to cube that expression, which means you're going to have to deal with a cube expanding things out, and that's dangerous. Whenever you have to do more algebra, the more algebra you do, the more you open yourself up to mistakes. On the other hand, if you solve for y in terms of x, then you're not going to open up yourself to many mistakes because there's not many y's there. So the smart strategy is let's solve for y. In fact, 
one of the things we can do is we don't even have to solve for y, we can solve for 4y. So notice that I could say that 4y is equal to 2x plus 4. Because I can move the minus 4x minus 8 to the other side and divide by 2. So I'm going to substitute. So this becomes 4x cubed minus 2x plus 4 minus 14x plus 4 equals 0. Now if we clean this up, we'll see that we get minus 4x cubed. We get a minus 2x minus 14x is a minus 16x and a minus 4 plus 4 which cancel. Ah, wow, it's becoming clean. It's almost like they want us to have nice answers, because they do. So we start chipping away. We see that both terms have 4 and x as factors, so we pull those out, x squared minus 4. x squared minus 4 are factors, because it's this difference of squares, x plus 2, x minus 2. And then we say, hey, great news, we want to make this equal to 0, so from this, we can get the following conclusions. That x equals 0, negative 2, or positive 2. And that's it. That's what we can conclude. Now, once we know those, we come back to this other relationship, 4y equals 2x plus 4, or of course we could have written this as y equals a half x plus 1. So if you plug in x equals 0, that will say well, y equals a half times 0 plus 1, which means that y equals 0, so I get the point 0 comma 1. If I plug in x equals negative 2, I'm going to get uh, negative a half times 2, sorry, a half times negative 2 is negative 1, plus 1 is 0, so that says y equals 0, so this gives me the point negative 2 comma 0, and if I plug in 2, we get 2 times a half is 1 plus 1 is 2, so I get the point 2 comma 2. So I get three points. There are three critical points. We have now finished phase 1. We now move to phase two, we'll change color. So phase two is what? Well, classify. So to classify, we're going to look at our discriminant, or Hessian. And uh, if you ever want to know how to pronounce Hessian with a really bad fake German accent, just go visit Dr. Schenk and do some reps. He'll tell you. He'll show you. He's great at it. Well, I suppose if you can be great at doing a bad thing, then he's great. Okay, so let's talk about these things. Well, we, we figure these out. F sub x, x. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x, 12x squared, and that's gone, minus 14. Everything else goes away. F sub y, y, 8. Well, that's going to be nice. And F sub x, y, uh, negative 4. So negative 4 squared. All right, now, for this, remember, we actually don't care about the value. It's all about the sign. We saw the sign, and it'll open up our eyes when we see the sign. So, we'll start d0, comma, 1. Well, what happens? We're going to get negative 14 times 8 minus 16. Well, look, I don't care what the value is. I can clearly see that that's negative. So... Negative. All right, good. What does that allow us to say? Well, since it's negative, that says this is a saddle. Done. Okay, now let's plug in, say, negative 2, comma, 0. Well, that would be 12 times 4 minus 14 times 8 minus 16. Well, 12 times 4 is 48, minus 14, uh, this would be 34, times 8 would be like 200 something, 200 something minus 16, positive. Okay, again, I don't need to know the value, I just need to know the sign. So we're positive. Well, what does that mean? Well, as Dr. Shank would say, that means that we're positive, it's a min or a max. But we've got to know which one. So for that, the key is, Look at either fxx or fyy. In this case, fyy is really easy because it's always positive. So fyy being positive says that this point is a, it's a min. So fyy positive. So we can conclude that negative 2, 0 is a min. In fact, we could even say more specifically a local min. You don't need to add the word local, though. It's just a min. 
when we talk about this classification, we can only talk about what's happening very nearby. All right, last point. Well, two, two. In fact, it's the same computation. Because we square x, so the sign doesn't matter, and there's no y involved. So this is positive. Fyy is still positive because it, it's always 8. And so this point 2, 2 is still, or I shouldn't say still, is also a local min. And now we're done. There's our answer. Done. Done. One of our favorite types of problems. All right. On to number 11. Find the absolute minimum and absolute maximum of f of xy is equal to 3x squared plus 2xy plus 3y squared minus 4x plus 4y over the triangular region. Okay, so hold on, let's sketch this. So we're trying to find the absolute maximum in triangular region, negative 2, negative 2, so let's say that's roughly here. Uh, 2, negative 2, which is roughly here and 2, 2, which is roughly there. So we have a triangle. Now, notice it's a triangular region. So let's be really clear here. We want not just the triangle, the edge. We want the whole thing. So we're looking for, over this triangle here, how big can the function get? How small can the function get? Okay, now, whenever you, you see the word absolute max and absolute min, you know that it's a, it's a simple process, so don't, don't get nervous. What's the process? First step, make a list. In fact, that's the majority of the work. Just make that list. And so, since it's the majority of the work, check it. In fact, probably should check it twice. Now, after you've done that, um, you plug in and say, look, the maximum have to be somewhere on that list. We'll talk about the list in a moment as we go through. Plug in all the points on that list. Largest value is your absolute max. Smallest value, absolute min. And then you're done. That's it. So make a list, plug it in, and just circle the largest and smallest numbers. And you're done. How hard could that be? OK, well, the hard part is the list. So the list, we look for three places. First off, the interior. Now, that says on the inside of the triangle. So when we're doing points on the interior, look for where the gradient is equal to zero. So that's the same thing that we talked about before. OK, so where is the gradient equal to zero? In our case, that would become a set of two equations. Take the derivative with respect to x. 6x plus 2y minus 4 equals zero. Take the derivative with respect to y. 2x plus 6y plus 4 equals 0. OK, two equations, two unknowns. Well, we do the same thing we've been doing all along. Uh, we can just combine. So for instance, if I take this bottom equation and multiply it by negative 3 and add, you'll see that the x's cancel. And what will happen? Well, we're going to get 2y minus 18y, which is really negative. Uh, so that's 2 minus 18 is negative 16y. And negative 4 minus 12 is minus 16 equals 0. And if you solve, you get that y equals, anyone see it? Negative 1. So I just combine the two equations together. The x is canceled. Solve for y. Or, of course, we could have done something a little different. We could have combined it a different way and canceled the x's. Uh, sorry, cancel the y's. Once you know y, you get negative 6, uh, sorry, 6x minus 2 minus 4 equals 0, or 6x equals 6, so x equals 1, which means that on our list of points, we have the point 1 comma negative 1. Well, we possibly have the point 1 negative 1. What's something we should do to make sure we have that point? Yeah, I've got to check if it's in the region. And in this case, it's right here. So yes, 1, negative 1 is definitely on our list of things to check. Now, the next thing to throw in, just because it's really convenient, is the corners. It's super easy to do this, and otherwise, you might forget them. So our corners, 
are easy to identify because we were told what our corners were. So negative 2, negative 2, 2, negative 2, and 2, 2. Okay, what's the last thing? Well, really we've got now the edges, or if you like, the boundary. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we work on every single boundary, and we reduce it down in dimension. Now, the easiest way to do that is using parameterization. So we're going to do three boundaries, because we have three lines in this triangle. So let's go through and work out every one. Well, this boundary, let's talk about this line. Do we know what this line is? Yeah, y equals x. Now, you can parameterize this one by using t comma t, where x equals y. So in other words, wherever I see an x, I put a t. Where I see y, I put a t. And so if I do that, so we get that f of t comma t would be equal to 3t squared plus 2t squared plus 3t squared minus 4t plus 4t, which the 4t's cancel, becomes 10t squared. Now, we want to know where the critical point is. So we take the derivative. If I take the derivative of 10t squared, what do I get? 20t, so it equals to 0, gives me t equals 0, which translates into the point 0, 0, which means that point is on our list. 0, 0. OK. Let's go to this side. Now, what is that? Well, that corresponds, remember, this is the point 2, negative 2, and this is the point 2, 2. Well, that corresponds to the line x equals 2. So I can parameterize this 2 comma t. So I look at f of 2 comma t. And so everywhere I see x, I put 2, and everywhere I see y, I put t. So that's going to become 12 plus 4t, not 40, 4t, uh, plus 3t squared minus 8 plus 4t. Or, if we simplify that, that's going to be 3t squared plus 8t plus 4. Take the derivative, we get 6t plus 8 equals 0 which corresponds to t equals minus 8 over 6 or minus 4 over 3. So minus 4 over 3 puts us down here. But it's still on the edge, still on the edge. So that's a point we have to consider. So remember that that's 2 comma negative 4 over 3. All right, one side to go. Let's do it, finish it up so we can finish off the problem. So on this side, what's true down on that edge? Yeah, y equals negative 2. y equals negative 2. So t comma negative 2. That's the parameterization for that edge. So f of t comma negative 2. All right, well, again, we go through and do the same thing. Everywhere we see an x, we put t. Everywhere we see y, we put negative 2. So 3t squared minus 4t plus 12. Then it's minus 4t. Uh, then it's minus 8. And so if we work this out, it'll look fairly similar. It's 3t squared minus 8t plus 4. Take the derivative. 6t minus 8 equals 0. So we get t equals 8 over 6 this time which is 4 thirds, which is OK. That just means we're over here. Again, that's the point. So plug it into our parameterization. That is 4 thirds negative 2. Now, I should pause and, and say, if you're getting nervous about, I don't know how to find parameterization of, of, of these things, let me be clear. If we put this kind of problem on, on the test, we would help with that. We're not going to make you do anything really weird. We'll give you something fairly straightforward. So don't panic about that part. Just remember the process. The process is more important. That's what we want to test you on. We want to test you on, do you understand the process? All right, we've made our list. Now we check it. Yep, good, we've checked it. What comes next? We need to plug them in. 
So we get to plug every single one of these points into our function. So this is our, we will probably make lots of little tiny mistakes, but that's okay. All right, so I don't need to have that information. I'll cover that up for a second here. So here we go, f at 1, negative 1. So that would be equal to 3 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 minus 4. Well, if we put that all together, that's 6 minus 10, which is negative 4. All right, f of negative 2, negative 2. So that's going to be 12, and then we're going to have plus, uh, yeah, negative 2, negative 2, 12 plus 8 plus 12 plus 8 minus 8, which will become 30. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Sorry, what? 32? Oh, man, I hate it when I get that wrong. F of 2, negative 2. Okay, so similar process. It's 12 minus 8 plus 12. And now here it'll be minus 8 minus 8, which is 24 minus 24, which is 0. F at 2 comma 2. Now that one, I think I can get that one right. 12 plus 8 plus 12 minus 8 plus 8, which will be equal to 32 again. All right, 4 down, 3 to go. 0, 0. Ah, I can do this one. 0 plus 0 plus 0 minus 0 plus 0 is 0. F of 2 negative four-thirds. Okay, this one we'll have to think about carefully. So we're going to get 12. And we're going to get 2 times x times y, which is going to be negative sixteen-thirds plus 3 times negative four-thirds square. So that's plus 3 times sixteen-ninths. We'll clean this up in a second. Minus 4 times 2, which is 8. And then 4 times Negative 4 thirds is negative 16 thirds. Okay, well, let's clean this up. Uh, first off, that 3 goes in there, so that makes things simpler. We'll put everything over 3. So that's 36 over 3 minus 16 over 3. And this becomes plus 16 over 3 minus 24 over 3 minus 16 over 3. We get some cancellation here. 36 minus 40 to 36 minus 40 is negative four-thirds. Okay, last part, f at four-thirds negative two equals da-da-da-da-da-da, also negative four-thirds. Okay, I'll, I'll let you check that one. Okay, there's symmetry on this problem, it turns out, if you see it. Now, what do we do? We're not done yet. What's our last step? Yeah, we look for the largest one. What's the biggest one? 32. Now, it doesn't matter if you have it repeated. That's okay. You can achieve the, the absolute max multiple times. So 32, that's our absolute max. All right, the other thing is we look for absolute min, which is <coughs> negative 4. Absolute min. So in this case, it turned out that the absolute min happened to be in the interior and the absolute max happened to be a, a corner, uh, one of these two faraway corners. Lots of different possibilities are, can happen. Okay, so that's number 11. Let's do number 12. All right. So, number 12. Find x and y which are greater than or equal to 0, which maximizes 3xy minus 5y subject to the constraint 4x plus 3y plus xy equals 30. So here it's a maximization problem where really we're saying, look, we're, we're trying to maximize this function, 3xy minus 5y, subject to a constraint. Now the fact that xy are greater than or equal to 0 comes from some other context, probably that these things are, are counting something. You want to 
do something x times and something y times. So we can't have negative values. So don't get too caught up on the x, y greater than or equal to zero. What kind of problem does this? What kind of tool, I should say, do we need to use? Yeah, yeah. This is a, a Lagrange multiplier problem. So, so when you have optimization with constraint, that looks at Lagrange multipliers. So this is a straightforward process. What do you do? Well, there's step one, which says set up a system of equations. Gradient of f equals lambda gradient of g, g equals c. Now, I talked about f. That's what we're trying to optimize. The g is your constraint. So this is your g function, g of x, y. So now you have a system of equations. Your second step is you're going to solve. And then the third step is you're going to give the answer. Because basically, that's the whole process. Once you've solved in step two, you've found the points that you're after. If you only find one, then that's it. Now, we're not going to ask you to be really careful and say, oh, is it, is it really a max that you found? We're just going to say, if you want to get one point out from step two, it is what you want. Don't panic and say, I, I got to do more and I've got to make sure. OK, so let's, let's take a second here. Let's set up our system of equations. So gradient of f equals lambda gradient g really means we look at partial derivatives. I take the partial derivative with respect to x. That gives me 3y. That's equal to lambda times root of this with respect to x, which is 4 plus y. Now I take the derivative with respect to y. Derivative of f with respect to y, 3x minus 5. That's going to equal lambda times derivative of g with respect to y, which is 3 plus x. Now, from here, what I like to do is I like to solve for lambda. Because what I really want to do is get another relationship between x and y. I already have one relationship between x and y from my constraint. I want a second one. So I do that. So I solve for lambda. 3y over 4 plus y will be equal to lambda. And that'll also be equal to 3x minus 5 over 3 plus x. Now we cross multiply. 3y times 3 plus x is going to be equal to 3x minus 5 times 4 plus y. All right. Well, multiply this out. 9y plus 3xy will be equal to 12x plus 3xy, coming from the outside, minus 20 minus 5y. You'll see nice cancellation going on there. And so what do we have? Well, we get 14y plus, uh, sorry, 14y equals 12x minus 20. So this gives us a nice relationship for x and y. Now we already have a relationship up here, so now we've got an idea. It's like, well, let's use some relationship to solve. And so we can use any relationship we want. In this case, it doesn't really matter what we solve for. Let's go ahead and solve for x. Why not? It doesn't matter. So uh, 12x would equal 14y plus 20. So x would be equal to 14y plus 20 over 12, which we could at least take out a factor of 2. 7y plus 10 over 6. Now we are going to take that. Why do you say that? OK. Thank you. You had me worried there. I, I am probably going to make a couple mistakes today. Don't, don't think it's like, ah, he, he's done this all the, all the time. Of course he's going to do it perfect. No, 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 especially towards the end. It's gonna, my pictures are going to start looking terrible. Because, you know, there's something about mental energy. And, and it really starts to wind you down. So, you know, you've got to prepare for these things, which is, is why you don't want to overtax yourself on Thursday. You just want to, you know, Thursday should be like some, some nice relaxing warm-up problems, you know. Do some like it's three times nine, it's 27, you know, just something, something light. Don't want to, don't want to go too hard on, on Thursday. Okay, so I have x, I plug it in up here. So I get four times seven y plus 10 over six 
plus 3y plus 7y plus 10 over 6 times y equals 30. Okay, that was bad planning. All right. Multiply everything by 6, and here we go. We'll get 28y plus 40, because I'm multiplying by 6, so I'm going to clear the denominators, and I'm going to also multiply through, plus 18y plus 7y squared plus 10y equals 180. Okay, again, I multiplied everything by 6, multiple, uh, distributed out the terms. And at this point, I'm probably thinking, oh boy, this is not looking promising. Well, let's see what happens. Okay. I, I tend to agree with you, this is not looking promising, but who knows? Who knows? So, group. We got the 7y squared. For 18y, we got 18 plus 10 plus 28 makes 56 y. It's the 10 to 18 to 28. Now the 40 and the 180. Well, 40 and 180, I'd bring that across, so it'd be minus 140 equals zero. Well, what can we do? Well, we can factor. First thing is, pull out a seven, because everything is a multiple of seven. Wow, it's almost like they worked really hard to make it work. Yes, they did, because I did that. Okay, factor. Well, you should firmly believe that everything factors. That's a false belief. It's not true. But when it comes to the test questions, they factor surprisingly often. Okay, seven, then here we go. Uh, how does this factor? Well, y and y. I need two things that multiply together to give me 20 and add to give me 8. Well, plus 10 minus 2 does that. <clears throat> and so I can say, cool, so what does that tell me? Well, that says that either y equals negative 10, but no, no, can't be, because y is greater than equal to 0, or y equals 2. Well, that's possible, so that must be what y is. So that tells me that y equals 2. And now, once I know y equals 2, I say that x would equal 7 times 2 plus 10 over 6. Well, 7 times 2 is 14, plus 10 is 24, over 6 is 4. So the x should be 4 and y should be 2. Now, what do we do next? And the answer is we box it. Because we weren't looking for the value, we were looking for the x and the y. And we found them. x equals 4, y equals 2. Easy, easy. We probably would have guessed that to start. We would be highly suspicious that these should be nice numbers. Now, this is the halfway point. How are you doing? Okay, good. Okay, so back to work. Uh, now that we've done all the easy problems, Let's go and work on the hard problems. Well, no, come on. How much harder they, could they be? Famous last words. OK, so one last max and min, and then we get into integration, which is, ah, integration is fun. We love integration problems. So find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values of f of xy equals x squared plus 4y squared for the closed bounded region of the point satisfying 5x squared plus 12xy plus 20y squared is at most 60. Now, this is just the same absolute max and min idea as we did before, but I want to emphasize that this one you can do with a slightly different idea. So what do you do? Well, you check for your interior. You're going to make a list. So for the interior, what do we have? Well, we take our gradient, set it equal to 0. In this case, we want 2x equals 0 and 8y equals 0, because 0 with respect to x, 0 with respect to y. Well, it's pretty easy to solve. 0, 0. So that's our only interior point. Now, here's our difference. This curve that describes the boundary, that's when we have 5x squared plus 12xy plus 20y squared equals 64. So for the boundary, what we can do is do something a little different. We can use Lagrange. So in this case, what we want to do is we want to optimize f of xy equals x squared plus 4y squared 
subject to the fact that 5x squared plus 12xy plus 20y squared is equal to 64. So this is acting as our g here. So we do Lagrange to do the boundary. So gradient of f equals lambda g. So we have 2x is going to be equal to lambda 10x plus 12y. And 8y is going to be equal to lambda, with respect to y, is 12x plus 40y. Solve for lambda, 2x over 10x plus 12y has to be equal to 8y over 12x plus 40y. Again, those were both equal to lambda. Cross multiply, and you get 24x plus 80xy is equal to 80xy, uh, whoops, sorry, 24x squared, uh, 80xy plus 96y squared. The xy's cancel. And then 24, well, let's see, uh, 24 and 96. Well, 24 doesn't go exactly into 96, does it? It does? Oh, yeah, it's 4, yeah. Wow, that made it really nice. So this becomes x squared equals 4y squared. So that says that when I'm trying to optimize on the boundary that x squared equals 4y squared, well, in particular, that tells me that I need to have either x equals 2y or x equals negative 2y, because I could take the square roots of both sides and then remember plus or minus. Now, what are our, what's our boundary? Well, our boundary is this 5x squared plus 12xy plus 20y squared equals 64. So if x equals 2y, what does this become? Um, I, I need more space here. So x equals 2y, this is going to say I have 5 times 2y squared, which will be 5 times 4y squared, or 20y squared, plus 24xy, oh, sorry, 24y squared, plus 20y squared equals 64, or 64y squared equals 64, so you get y equals plus or minus 1. Which gives us the following pairs of points. It gives us the point 2 comma 1 and negative 2, negative 1. On the other hand, if x equals negative 2y, we're going to have something very similar. The only difference that follows through on x equals negative 2y is we're going to have the following. We're going to get 20y squared minus 24y squared plus 20y squared equals 64. Now, 20 plus 20 minus 24, that's become 16y squared equals 64, or you get that y squared equals 4, so y equals plus minus 2, and you plug those in. So what does that give us? Well, it gives us the points negative 4 comma 2 and 4 comma negative 2. And that's it. Those are the only points on the boundary using Lagrange. So in this case, it's a shorter list. So the previous one, we had seven points. Here, we only have five. And we can probably actually evaluate because there's no fractions. Ah, we like no fractions. At 0, 0, 0. Easy. At 2, 1, 4 plus 4, 8. Negative 2, negative 1. Well, that's going to be 4 plus 4, whoops, which is 8. Negative 4, negative 2. That's going to be 16 plus 16, which is going to give me 32. And a 4, negative 2, again, 16 plus 16 gives me 32. And so my answer is 0 is my absolute min, 32 is my absolute max. And we're done. So that's a way you can combine Lagrange if you're doing an absolute max and absolute min. All right. And away we go with integration. So, a classic problem, change the order of integration. Okay, this is something you should definitely be comfortable with about setting bounds and changing bounds. When we say change bounds, changing the order. So, how do we start this? Well, we remember that these are really giving us lots of information. So, it's telling us that my bounds are saying from, whoops, not x, y equals 0 to y equals 1, and then x equals y to x equals y to the one-third. 
So when I come to plot what my current bounds look like, I have the following situation. I say, what are my bounds? Well, uh, I have this line, x equals y. Probably let me just try to find a darker color. So x equals y. That's easy to sketch, x equals y. Or, by the way, y equals x. Then I have x equals y to the one third. Now, that might not sound as familiar, but you say, well, hold on, what's another way to write that? If x is the cubed root of y, then that really says y equals x cubed. So y equals x cubed, we know that picture because they kept showing it to us over and over again. They said, oh, be careful, just because your derivative is zero doesn't mean you're at a max or a min. So we know that picture. So this is the curve x equals y to the one third, or, as we already noted, y equals x cubed. Okay. So, and finally, where does y go? Well, y goes from zero up to one. Now, by great coincidence, not that great, that's where they intersect. So, the region is here. And, in fact, we can be a little bit more precise in saying that currently what's happening is we're slicing more or less in thin horizontal stripes. So, if we're changing the order of integration, we want to go to thin vertical stripes. So, here we go. Integrate, integrate. The function itself doesn't change. Because you're not changing the function, you're changing the order of integration. All right. Now, what do we do? Well, I set bounds from the outside in. So I ask myself, where does x go between? Well, I start over here. That's at zero. And I'm going to keep going all the way over to where they intersected. Well. That's not hard to find. One. Where does y go from? Well, from the lower curve, that's the x cubed curve, to the higher curve, which is the x curve. So there I go. Now I've done my change in order of integration. OK, so we integrate. Now, the first integral is not bad because I'm integrating with respect to y, and there is no y. So that's beginning to become 4 sine 2x squared minus x to the fourth times y evaluated from x cubed to x, dx. I evaluate, and I'll go ahead and combine that with the 4. So this would become 4x minus 4x cubed times sine 2x squared minus x to the fourth, dx. And now we have this integral to do. And it looks terrible, but then we remember, hold on, we weren't ever going to be given a bad integral, so there must be something clean. And here's the clean. If we set that to be u, that's du. So that's not bad. It's basically sine of u du. Integral of sine, negative cosine. So negative cosine, 2x squared minus x to the fourth, evaluated 0 to 1. So we plug that in. So that's negative cosine. Plug in 1, 2 minus 1, 1 minus negative cosine of 0. Uh, plug in 0, get 0 minus 0. So actually 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So minus minus makes plus. So I'll put that up front. 1 minus, and cosine of 1 is oftentimes written as cosine of 1. Can't really simplify. And we're done. Done. Now, sometimes the problem will say pretty explicitly, change the order of integration. Sometimes it won't. So how do you know? How do you know? Well, look for signs. One thing is, look for an integral that you couldn't integrate. You can't integrate that with respect to x. Don't try to be creative. Don't do it. You know, uh, one thing I didn't say explicitly, but now that we're into integration, I'm going to say it explicitly now. We had this review sheet. Notice that there's something on this review sheet that says basic integrals. Do you see how this is a tiny, tiny list? These are the only integrals we expect you to be able to do. If it's not on this list, don't do it. Because you're probably going to do it, either one, you've made a terrible mistake, or two, you're going to do it wrong. The only thing that we want you to be able to do, other than the obvious things, is substitution. So these are the only integrals, and similarly, the only derivatives we expect you to be able to do. So, so don't try to get creative. Don't try to get creative. So if you see something you can't integrate with respect to that first variable, switch 
And then you can say, well, maybe I can make some progress when I do my second variable. All right, that's number 14. Ah, cool, the last 10. Here we go, number 15. Let R be the region between the origin and the curve R equals theta for zero less than or equal to theta less than or equal to pi. Now, that is a curve we've seen a few times in our class. It's called the Archimedean spiral. It doesn't matter exactly what it looks like, but it looks vaguely like this. So here's this curve R equals theta. And given that the density at any point is one, find the moment of inertia with respect to the z-axis. Now I will say, in fairness, this might make you nervous, be saying, ah, oh, boy, do I have to remember the moment of inertia with respect to the z-axis? This problem has been slightly reworded. So this was the original way the problem was going to be worded on a final. But they said, you know, our students may not remember what the moment of inertia with respect to the z-axis is. So here it is. This was actually the way it was phrased. Integral with respect to r, x squared plus y squared times your density, dA. Now, uh, what does this mean? When you talk about the inertia with respect to the z-axis, it's the inertia with respect to the origin. And the distance to the origin is the square root of x squared plus y squared. Remember, inertia has a distance squared term coming into play. So we were asked, OK, f do this integral for this region. Now, hopefully, you're going to be like, hmm, how do I do this region? Hmm, I don't know. Uh, maybe I should do polar. Well, why? Because it gives you your region in terms of polar. If, you, if it's giving you your description is polar, use polar. If your description is in terms of circles, use polar. And so, and also if you have an x squared plus y squared, use polar. So there's lots of things that say this should be polar. So here we go. So we're going to switch to polar. x squared plus y squared becomes r squared. Delta is 1. dA in polar r d r d theta. Where does theta go from? 0 to pi. Where does r go from? Well, it goes from the center out to the edge of the curve. So r goes from 0 to theta. And there we go. There's our setup. So this is r cubed. Integral of r cubed is 1 fourth r to the fourth divided from 0 to theta. So this becomes integral 0 to pi of 1 fourth theta to the fourth integrate that, that'll be 1 20th theta to the fifth from 0 to pi, which will be 1 20th times pi to the fifth minus 0, and we're done. I will say, oftentimes people get nervous about integration problems, but in a couple of cases, the integration problems are oftentimes easier because nice things happen. We're testing you on your ability to understand our principles. So keep that in mind. Don't panic. Not every problem has to be hard. Change the integral, number 16. Change the integral, negative 2 to 2. Integral 0 to root 4 minus x squared. And then the next integral, square root of x squared plus y squared to the square root of 8 minus x squared plus y squared of x squared plus y squared dz dy dx into cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Do not evaluate. So this was from the final from last year. Now a couple of things we can talk about. First off, if we think about what these curves are, remember these are this layer here, it's a z layer. So if I focus on this, this is a z and this is a z. So z equals square root of x squared plus y squared is a curve you should know. It's a cone. So it's a nice cone, which by the way, forms a nice 45 degree angle or pi over 4. On the other hand, this curve z equals square root of 8 minus x squared minus y squared is probably not written the way that we would work with it. If we squared both sides and rearranged it, this would become x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 8, which means that this is a sphere. Now technically, because it's equals, it's the top half of the sphere. Now, so it's the top half of a sphere of radius root 8. All right. So that's good. Now let's look down in the plane. Let's look at these bounds. We know the outer layer are x bounds. x equals negative 2 to x equals 2. So I'm going from negative 2 to positive 2. And then I'm going from y equals 0, which is the axis, 
to y equals square root of 4 minus x squared. Well, y equals square root of 4 minus x squared is half a circle. So in the xy plane, this is what my region looks like. It looks like the half of a circle. Now we can put this all together, uh, but let's go ahead and just figure out cylindrical coordinates because here it's kind of easy to spot what happens in cylindrical. Integral, integral, integral. x squared plus y squared and cylindrical coordinates becomes what? r squared because x squared plus y squared equals r squared. We should know that. dz, dy, dx, this is our dv piece. In cylindrical coordinates, dv becomes r dz dr d theta. Now, we look at our picture. Where does theta go from? Well, theta is going 0 to pi. Where does r go from? Well, it goes from 0 out to the edge of the circle, 0 to 2. Where does z go from? Well, we come here. That's telling us what z does. It says z starts at square root of x squared plus y squared, or z equals r, and it goes up to z equals square root of 8 minus x squared minus y squared. Now, notice that this can be rewritten as 8 minus x squared plus y squared, where I factor out a minus, and so this becomes square root of 8 minus r squared. Now, what comes next? Here. What else do I need to do for the cylindrical? Box it. I'm done. That's cylindrical. Okay, let's talk spherical. So spherical, we have a few things which are going to be different. Now, x squared plus y squared, that's not so easy to remember what x squared plus y squared becomes in, into spherical, but there's a nice little fact that r is equal to rho sine phi. So since I have it in terms of r, this r squared will become rho squared sine squared phi. Okay, that's, that's what my x squared plus y squared becomes. My dv for spherical coordinates is rho rho sine of phi d rho d phi d theta. Okay, so now I've got to figure out what's happening with these bounds. Now, some of these bounds are easy. Notice that the thetas match. Well, that means that the theta bounds match, because theta does the same thing in both systems. So if theta is going from 0 to pi, it still goes 0 to pi. 0 to pi. Phi, what is phi doing? Well, phi says, how far off from the z-axis do you go? So it will help to understand what our picture is. We, didn't, we drew sort of our, our pieces. If we combine these two together, what we'll see is we'll see a cone on the bottom and topped by a part of a sphere on the top. So this is what our solid looks like. So if that's what our solid looks like, we say, okay, where does phi range from? So what's the answer? Where does phi go between? We go from zero, which is straight up, and we're going to keep going up until we hit the edge of the cone, which is at phi equals pi over 4. So zero to pi over 4. Now, what about rho? Well, rho goes from the center out. So we're going to, whoops, we're going to go from the center out until we hit the sphere. <clears throat> well, how far is that sphere away from the origin? Or in other words, what's the radius of the sphere? Well, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 8. That 8, <coughs> excuse me, is the square of the radius. And so we're going from 0 to square root of 8. And now what? Yeah, that's, that's the spherical. And we're done. We're finished. Now, since we're starting to get into parts that involve drawing, <coughs> excuse me, I want to make something clear. We are not testing you on your ability to draw. If there's any problem where having a picture might be helpful to you, we will hand you the picture. It will be on the test already. So do not panic. Anything that involves some weird thing in three dimensions, we will let you see, here's a picture. And then you're like, cool, I love pictures. OK. Now, some of our favorite problems. So some people think these are the hardest problems, but I say these are the funnest. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about doing our substitutions. These are multivariable substitutions, sometimes called changing variables. Sometimes we talk about use the Jacobian. So here we go. You have this integral from 0 to 1, integral y cubed to 2 minus y cubed of y squared over 1 plus the quantity x plus y cubed squared dx dy. And we're going to find it. And we're going to do it by making a substitution. And it gives us a substitution. u equals x plus y cubed. v equals x minus y cubed. So I want to show you a very simple process to go through and solve it. So first the first step in this process is identify the substitution. And there it is. I've done the first step. I've identified the substitution. Step one is done. So u is x plus y cubed. v is x minus y cubed. Now, step two, in the past I said solve for x and y. You know what? Let's not even bother with that. Let's skip that. Let's save ourselves a step. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on the three pieces of the integral. Every integral has three parts. There's the bounds, which is what's the region you're integrating over. There's the function, and then there's the how you break stuff up. Okay, so we're going to save the function to the end. Or at least we're going to put it off a little bit. What we're going to do is to make the following note. If I want to know what is du dv or du dv du doesn't really matter, then that's equal to the Jacobian as a function of xy in absolute value, dx dy or dy dx. Again, the order here doesn't matter yet because we haven't set bounds. Now, what do I mean by this Jacobian? This Jacobian here is the partial derivatives of these variables, these functions, u sub x, u sub y, v sub x, v sub y. <clears throat> okay, so in our case, what would that be? Well, in our case, u sub x, 1. u sub y, 3y squared. v sub x, 1. v sub y, minus 3y squared. Take the derivative here, you get minus 3y squared minus 3y squared is minus 6y squared. Now remember we take the absolute value of that, so that says 6y squared dx dy. Okay, so now I say, okay, cool. So I'm looking for a 6y squared dx dy. So I come up here and I say, okay, I got my y squared dx dy. Don't have my 6. <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and put a 6 there and multiply by 1, 6 in front. So remember, this part here becomes du dv or dv du. It depends on how we decide to integrate. Okay? That's one part done. Now that we've identified that part, now we can talk about the function. The reason I want to put the function off is because we might peel a little bit of it off for the Jacobian. So I don't want to do the function until I have the Jacobian settled. <clears throat> now, what's the function? Well, it's everything else. So I'll look on the function. So what, what's everything else? Well, it's uh, 1 6 times 1 over 1 plus x plus y cubed squared. And I say, huh, how can I rewrite that? Well, hey, x plus y cubed is u. So this will become 1 6 times 1 over 1 plus u squared. Cool. That's the, fu that's the function. I've now found my function. So I've now gotten how I break stuff up. I've now gotten my function. The last part are my bounds. And for this, I'll draw a picture. I'm told that I'm going from x equals y cubed which looks like this, roughly speaking. So x equals y cubed is here. So here's my x equals y cubed. And then I have x equals 2 minus y cubed, which looks something kind of similar to this. So here's my x equals 2 minus y cubed. And I'm told that y goes from 0 to 1. So in particular, uh, this is what the integral is doing. It's doing 2, 2, 2, 2. OK, that's my integral. So my third bound. My third boundary line is y equals 0. So to figure out my, my new integral, or sorry, to figure out my new region, I need to figure out what happens to each one of these curves. So let's go through these three curves. x equals y cubed. I want to rewrite this in terms of u and v. Well, that's x minus y cubed equals 0. 
and I say, aha, v equals 0. x equals 2 minus y cubed. Well, again, I'm trying to rewrite that in terms of u and v. That's x plus y cubed equals 2. So that becomes u equals 2. So that's not bad. v equals 0, u equals 2. The last curve, y equals 0. Well, this one is more, more subtle. And it's not clear what to do. So I say, OK, let me just go ahead and put y equals 0. What do I see? I see that u equals x and v equals x. And I say, well, what's the relationship between u and v? Well, the relationship is they both equal x. So if u equals x and v equals x, that tells me that it better be the case that they equal each other, u equals v. So these three curves will translate into the uv plane as, as these three curves, v equals 0, u equals 2, u equals v. So that we get our picture, uv plane, v equals 0, u equals 2, u equals v, we get a triangle. And here we go. There's our point 2, and there's our point 2. So now we put it all together. So the last step is put it all together. So we're going to integrate, integrate, and we'll set bounds in a second. We have 1 6 times 1 over 1 plus u squared. And now we come to our choice. Are we going to integrate du dv, or are we going to integrate dv du? In some sense, you can say, well, I kind of know the integral of 1 over 1 plus u squared, so I could go either way. I will say that it might be easier to start with dv du, because notice that if there's no v in there, the integral with respect to v is like super easy. And you should try, try that one first. Oftentimes, that's a symbol that something nice is about to happen. OK, so but you can try it both ways. When in doubt, just set it up both integrals and work them both out. So working out the bounds, u would go from 0 to 2, and v would go from where? Well, it would go from 0 up to the curve uh, v equals u. So 0 to u. So if we write this out, we get integral 0 to 2, 1 6 times v over 1 plus u squared. Evaluate from v equals 0 to v equals u, du, which is integral 0 to 2, and of 1 6, u over 1 plus u squared. Well, can we integrate u over 1 plus u squared? The answer is, yes, we can. What is it? 1 12th log 1 plus u squared. I evaluate from 0 to 1. And now you plug in 1, you get 1 12th log 5. Plug in 0, you get 1 12th log of 1. Log of 1 is 0. There's the answer. 1 12th log 5. OK. Now, you're probably thinking, you went pretty quick. I have questions. OK, let's do it again. Round two. Ring the bell. Let's compute the integral, 0 to 1, negative y cubed to 1 minus y cubed of x plus y cubed e to the power of y times x plus y cubed dx dy by carrying out the following change of variables, u equals y and v equals x plus y cubed. Now, so again, the process. First thing, figure out your substitution. Now, we're nice. No surprises. We're going to give it to you. Good. Life is good. We know our substitution. So we, now we know that we're going to say u equals y and v equals x plus y cubed. Next step is focus on the three pieces. Start with your Jacobian, which tells you how we break the stuff up. So I'm going to say, all right, I want to figure out du dv or dv du. doesn't really matter. I'll figure that out when I need to as to which order to take. And I know that's going to be the absolute value of the Jacobian, xy dx dy. Well, I've got to figure out what that is. So I say, well, that's going to be that 2 by 2 de determinant, u sub x, u sub y, v sub x, v sub y. So I start by taking these partial derivatives. Derivative of u with respect to x, well, 0, because it's not any x there. u with respect to y, 1. v with respect to x, 1. v with respect to y, 3y squared. Take this determinant, get negative 1. I don't really care, because I'm going to lose the sign. 
which tells me that du dv is equal to dx dy. Well, that's great. That says dx dy equals du dv. It means that I don't have to do anything to my function. I don't need to pull any of it off because of our, my change. So now I say, great, let's focus on the function. Second step. I have my x plus y cubed e to the power y times x plus y cubed. Well, what will that become? Well, I think about my variables. Everywhere where I see a y, I can put a u. Everywhere I see an x plus y cubed, I can put a v. Well, so that's v e to the uv. So that's what that's going to become. All right. Well, last part, the bounds, the bounds. You've got to know those bounds. OK, so what do they look like? Well, hmm, we're going to have a couple bounds. So the outside layer, that's y equals 0, y equals 1. And we're going from x equals negative y cubed to x equals 1 minus y cubed. OK, well, draw a picture. We're going to go x equals negative y cubed. Well, that looks like, whoops, x equals negative y cubed. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Sorry, almost got that. Uh, yes. So x equals y cubed goes there. So x equals negative y cubed. We'll do that, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. x equals negative y cubed. OK, x equals 1 minus y cubed. We're going to give you pictures, OK? If you're like, how are we supposed to do this if he's struggling? We're nice. We're nice. I swear to you, we're nice. You know, we're just really friendly. We're your, your, your friendly neighborhood cow constructors. OK, so x equals 1 minus y cubed is shifted over. And then we're going from uh, 0 to 1. y equals 0 to y equals 1. So, so we're doing this sort of thing right here. So here, we actually have four bounding curves. And my picture's getting a little bit convoluted, so let me be careful here. So one bounding curve is x equals minus y cubed. Another bounding curve is x equals 1 minus y cubed. Another bounding curve is actually right up here. It's actually a full line across. It looks like it's almost not there, but it is. y equals 1. And the last one, y equals 0. So you translate each one of these curves into your new variables. OK, so y equals 0. What will that become? Yeah, u equals 0. y equals 1, what will this become? u equals 1. x equals 1 minus y cubed, which is the same as x plus y cubed equals 1, which will become v equals 1. x equals negative y cubed, or x plus y cubed equals 0, which is going to become v equals 0 which says that once you translate over into the uv plane, it's actually a square. That's our region that we're integrating over. So this is beautiful. This is beautiful. OK, so now we're ready to, to carry out the substitution. So over the unit square, well, we now have one of two choices. 0 to 1, 0 to 1, our function, v e to the uv, times du dv, or of du dv, or 0, 1, 0, 1, v e u v, dv du. Now, the question is, which one? You should think about this, but not think too long or too hard. Think about which one you can do most easily. This second one can be done if we use parts. Parts is not hard, but it's hard enough it didn't make our list. We don't expect you to know integration by parts, which means it's probably not this one. So let's do this integral. What's the integral of v e to the u v with respect to u? It'll be e to the u v, because essentially you have to compensate, you would divide by v, and the v's cancel. And we're going to evaluate from u equals 0 to u equals 1 dv. So this becomes equal to the integral 0 to 1 of e to the v minus 1 dv. 
Well, that's an easy integral. That's e to the v minus v evaluated from 0 to 1, which is e minus 1 minus 1 minus 0, or final answer, e minus 2. And that's it. Done. Done. Okay. Fun. Good times. Now we actually drew a picture, so okay, this is getting serious. Previously we didn't have a picture drawn, but that's because my ability to draw three-dimensional pictures that are non-trivial, uh, I'm not very good at. So here we have a solid. X and Y are greater than or equal to zero. Y squared is less than or equal to Z is less than or equal to four minus X squared. You might remember this, by the way, from one of our quiz problems. We actually had this surface. And here's the picture. Set up the iterated integrals for f of x, y, z over this solid, where the order of integration is dx, dz, dy, and the order of integration is dz, dy, dx. Okay. Now, the first one is not going to be too bad. So let's do dx, dz, dy. So I'm going to integrate, integrate, integrate some function f of x, y, z, and dx, dz, dy. Now, Here's my process for setting up bounds. Everybody has their own process. This is mine. I'm not saying mine is better. I'm saying mine is best for me, because I'm really used to it. I work on my bounds from the outside in, which means that my x bounds are the absolute last things that I want to set. So to help me understand how to set my y and z bounds, I'm going to somehow find a way to not see the x. And the way I do that is I'm going to look down the x-axis. So I stare down the x-axis, and if I stare down the x-axis, what will I see? Well, I'm going to see the yz plane. And what shape will I see? And the answer is, I'm going to see this shape. That's the shape I'm going to see in the yz plane, if I look down the x-axis. Because I'm going to see this bounding surface. See this surface right here? This is my surface, uh, this is my z equals y squared surface. This surface here, this front face, this is my z equals 4 minus x squared surface. So if I look down the x-axis, I'm going to see this picture in the yz plane. This is the curve z equals y squared. And now I ask myself, okay, what's happening? Well, I know that the height here is at 4. Why? Well, because I, I have to hit the top of this, and this is at 4 minus x squared. So this is at 4. So this height, this top part is at 4. So that tells me if it's z equals y squared that this number is 2. And now I'm ready to go. Y on the outside is between two numbers. Remember on the bounce, it's number, curve, surface. So the outside bounds between two numbers. In this case, 0 to 2. Next layer, between two curves. So I'm, I'm given some y, I want to go between, given some y, I'm going between two curves of z. So I'm going to go from z equals y squared to z equals 4. So y squared to 4. So number, curve, surface. What surface? Well, if I'm moving in the x direction, what's going to happen is I start in the back, and I'm going to come to the back face is the yz plane. The yz plane is at x equals 0. And I'm going to move until I hit this, this front surface. Well, that front surface is z equals 4 minus x squared. Do I put 4 minus x squared there? No. Remember, these are x bounds. So I need to solve for x. So I can solve for x. That's x squared equals 4 minus z, or x equals square root 4 minus z. And that's what goes there. OK, so that's half of our answer. Good. Halfway done. Because we're just setting up bounds. We can't iterate, I'm sorry, we can't integrate, because we don't know the function. So that's as far as we can go. Next step. OK. Well, that's another set of bounds. Different color. 
We want to integrate, integrate, integrate f of x, y, z, dz, dy, dx. Now, for this, I want to say, look, the last thing I want to worry about is z. So I'm going to look down the z-axis. Okay, so I stare down the z-axis and I ask myself, what do I see? The answer is I see something in the xy plane. Now this one is a little bit more subtle than most, but you know, it's a review session. We should, we should try to give you harder problems than what's on the test, because if we give you easier problems than what's on the test, you're not ready. Okay, does anybody see what I'm gonna see if I look down the z-axis? Yeah, you're gonna see a circle. Now actually you'll see just a quarter of a circle because you're only interested in the part where x and y are greater than or equal to zero. Now you're probably thinking, how in the world do you see a circle? Well, essentially what's happening is that the edge is this piece. That's what you're gonna see. This part here is what you're seeing as you're bound. Now what does that correspond to? Well, half of it is z equals four minus x squared, and the other half is z equals y squared. So when do these equal? Well, it's when x, 4 minus x squared equals y squared or x squared plus y squared equals 4. So what I'm seeing here is this is actually a circle with radius 2. Now this actually makes it pretty simple to, to go. Where does x go from? 0 to 2. Because I'm going to go from 0 to 2. Where does y go from? Well, I need to write y as a function of x. So if I solve, y squared is equal to 4 minus x squared, so y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. So I'm going to go from 0 to the square root 4 minus x squared. And now, where does z go from? Well, it's given to us in the problem. It goes from y squared to 4 minus x squared. And we're done. That's the answer. Good times, good times. If you like these problems, you can find more of these in the uh, exam three. That was a fun exam. Okay, now we're into the 20s. Woohoo! The end is drawing near. Okay, find the center of mass for the region outside of the sphere, rho equals cosine phi, and inside of the upper hemisphere of the unit sphere. Now this is, requires a little bit of visualization to see what's going on but not too bad. Now, rho equals cosine phi. It turns out that that's a sphere sitting right on the xy plane. And it happens to be a sphere of radius a half, or if you like, the height all the way up to the top is one. Now, on the other hand, what do we have? We're looking at the unit upper hemisphere of the unit sphere, which also has height one. So if we combine these two, what we've really done is the following, is, is we've taken our unit upper sphere, unit sphere and we've sort of drilled out a sphere out of the middle of that. So that's our shape. That's kind of an unusual shape, but that's okay. We are unusual people, I mean, engineers, mathematicians. People might call us nerds, but that's all right. That's all right. Now, what do we do? Well, we're looking for the center of mass. Now, it didn't say anything about density. If it doesn't give you anything about density, assume uniform density. Okay, so uniform density. So we'll assume density equals one. So now I want to focus on a few questions. Well, one thing is whenever I have a center of mass, always look for symmetry. Look for symmetry. Well, in our case, do we have any symmetry? The answer is yes. We have fantastic symmetry. The z-axis is beautiful symmetry. So in our case, we say, aha, our center of mass has to look like zero, zero, something by symmetry. Because we are, by, if you look at our picture, we have that rotational symmetry around the z-axis. So it's a point of symmetry. So that narrows it down. We're already two thirds of the way done. We've already found the x and the y coordinate. So all that's left for us to do all in quotation marks, is to find the z. Okay, so 
what do we need? Well, we know that z bar is the ratio, the moment with respect to the xy plane, over the mass. So let's start with the mass. So for the mass, what will it be? I'm going to integrate over my region of my density, 1 dv. Well, let's think about what tools we're going to use to integrate. How, or what coordinate system should we be using? Spherical. Why should we be using spherical? What's the suggestion, or what's the hint in this problem that we should be using spherical? Yeah, also they gave us spherical coordinates here, rho and phi. So if they start by handing you spherical coordinates, you're like, okay then, spherical it is, no problem. So all right, so we're going to use spherical coordinates. So what does dv become? Yeah, rho, rho, or rho squared, sine of phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. That's my, that's my dv. Where will theta go between? 0 and 2 pi, all the way around. Where will phi go from? 0 to pi over 2, pi over 2. Now why pi over 2? Phi equals 0 is straight up. Phi equals pi is straight down. Phi equals pi over 2 is the xy plane. So if you're stopping at the xy plane and you don't go below it, that means you're at phi equals pi over 2. Now the hard part about this one is rho. Where does rho go from? Well, the thing is you have two surfaces. You have rho equals 1 is your outer surface, and you have rho equals cosine phi is your inner surface. So where do you go from? Well, you go from the inner surface to the outer surface. So you go from cosine of phi out to 1. Okay, so now we've actually done the hardest part of this problem is to set it up the integrals. The rest of this will probably be nice and fun. By the way, because there's nothing in here that depends on theta, if I just did the, the theta integral and ignored the rest, I'd see I'd get 2 pi out. So I'm going to go ahead and just do that just to save myself space so I can try to fit this all on one page. So that's 2 pi is coming from the integral 2 pi d theta. Now I'm also going to be doing 0 to pi halves. You're, of course, going to have lots of ample space. There's only one problem per page. You've got tons of real estate, and you've got a blank page on the back, too. It's fantastic. You've got lots of space. So don't feel the need to, to be efficient. You should write so it's easy to check, and you should be organized, because that also makes it easy for you to check. Be nice to yourself. Be nice to yourself. Integrate with respect to rho on the inside. One third rho cubed, sine phi, and we're evaluating from cosine of phi up to 1. Uh, sorry, I, I, just reminding these are rows, d phi. So this becomes 2 pi integral 0 to pi halves. Uh, I'll put the 1 third out in front. So this is going to be sine of phi minus cosine cubed phi sine phi d phi. Now, how do we integrate this? Well, for this one, there's a couple things that you could do. Um, one thing is you could just integrate. One th or you could just make a substitution. You should say u equals cosine phi. du would be equal to negative sine phi d phi. And if you did that substitution, carry out the change of variables, that would be 2 pi thirds. Your balance would go from where to where? From, anyone know? One to zero. Aha, the wrong way. Well, that's okay. We have ways of fixing that. Okay, the sine of phi's are going to join with the d phi, and so we're going to end up with a minus, and then we're going to have one minus u cubed, du. So here's how we fix it. That minus, we just put the, put the integral into the order we're used to. 0 to 1, 1 minus u cubed du, which would be 2 pi thirds u minus 1 fourth, u to the fourth, from 0 to 1, which becomes 2 pi thirds times 1 minus 1 fourth, which is 3 fourths, which the 3's cancel, you can go divide and get a pi over 2. So that's m. So m equals pi over 2. We'll just 
remember that. Now, unfortunately, it looks like I'm not going to have enough space to do my next step. So I'm going to grab another piece of paper here. We'll call this our scratch page. So what comes next? Well, let's do the moment with respect to the x, y plane. If we do this computation, not too much changes. What does change? Well, the bounds don't change because it's still the same solid. The rho squared sine phi, d rho d phi d theta, that doesn't change because that's still our dv. What does change is what we integrate. So previously we were integrating 1. Now what do we integrate? We would integrate z, right? Because if you're looking for the moment with respect to the xy plane, you integrate distance times density. Density was still 1. So distance is z. But of course, we can't just put z in because we're in spherical coordinates. So what we do put in is rho cosine phi. Because rho cosine phi happens to be what z is. Yes? Um, for the mass, if it was sure. Yes, yes, you could. Yeah, if, if all your bounds are all numbers, you can pull them apart, assuming that also you can write, pull apart your function. Yeah, yeah, absolutely you can do that. It's a nice, nice trick to use, and occasionally we will do that. Okay, so now let's do this. Okay, do the same thing as I did before. I'm going to go ahead and note the 2 pi still is 2 pi, and then we have integral 0 to pi halves. And now when I integrate here, because I'm integrating rho cubed initially, this is going to become one-fourth rho to the fourth times cosine phi times sine of theta. Sorry, sine phi, excuse me. So from rho equals cosine phi to rho equals one d phi. And if we evaluate this, I'll go ahead and pull out the, the one-fourth. So that would become pi halves integral zero to pi halves of cosine phi sine phi minus cosine to the fifth phi sine phi d phi. All right, well, a little bit more interesting. Okay, so what do we do? Same substitution. I mean, that's the great thing about mathematics. If something worked once, it probably is going to work again. So go ahead and do the same process. U equals sine, d equals negative sine. So if we did that, we'd get pi halves and integral 1 to 0, like we did before. Then we'd have u minus u to the fifth. And then we'd have uh, minus du, because that sine phi d phi, uh, whoops, I forgot my d phi here. Sine phi d phi becomes minus du. Well, OK. so fix the minus to get the order right. So minus, minus plus 0, 1, u minus u to the fifth du. So that's pi halves times 1 half u squared minus 1 6 u to the sixth. I wait from 0 to 1. That's pi halves times 1 half minus 1 6. Well, 1 half is 3 6. 3 6 minus 1 6 is 2 6. So this is pi halves times 2 6. Well, 6 is, these cancel, pi 6. OK, so coming back up here and updating, the moment with respect to x, y is pi 6. Now, where do we get? Z bar is pi 6 over pi halves, which the pi's cancel. That's 2 6 or 1 third. So, Center mass would be 0, 0, 1 third. And we're done. Now, of course, we should pause for a second and double check 0, 0, 1 third. Is that reasonable? If it was 0, 0, 3, we're definitely wrong. If it was 0, 0, negative 2, definitely wrong. At least 1 third is, is in the middle between 0 and 1, and it tends to bias towards the bottom. Well, that seems reasonable because there's more stuff at the bottom. So we should expect it to be a little bit closer to the bottom than the top. OK, so that's 20. The final four. <clears throat> the final four problems. Well, the final four problems deal with the big 
what I would call the variants of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And these are so popular that on the final exams in the past, we've had at least one and usually two problems come from these final four ideas. 21. So suppose you have a curve, and it's a parameterized curve. Time goes from 0 to 1. And the curve is kind of a strange curve. t cosine 2 pi t sine pi halves t. So in other words, we have ourselves an x coordinate, that's our x of t, and our y coordinate, y of t. And we want to find the integral along the curve of 2xy plus 2x dx plus x squared plus e to the y dy. Now there's a couple of ways you can do that. One way you could do it is you could just say, go for it. Put everything in terms of t and, and cross your fingers and hope you remember all the various identities. Now, we are hoping you don't just go for it. We are hoping you're smart and say, hmm, is there something that can make it easy for us? Now, I don't know exactly what this curve does, but I can say a few things. I can figure out where it starts. So if, in other words, if I plug in 0, if I did that, I'd get 0 and 0, because t equals 0, sine of 0 is 0. So it starts here at 0, 0. And now I can also plug in 1. If I plug in 1, I'm going to get 1 times cosine of 2 pi, which is 1. And then I'm going to get sine of pi halves, which is 1, which means it's going to end over here at 1, 1. So here's the start. Here's the end. And then it's doing something in between. Now, I don't know what it is. I'm pretty sure it's not that. But it's doing something. Now, the question is, is there a way for me to somehow ignore the something in between? So the first of these four big ideas of the fundamental theorem of calculus says, you know, it would be really cool if you were integrating something which looked like this, gradient of f dot t ds. If you're integrating something of that form, life is awesome. <clears throat> we have a name for this, by the way. This is called conservative. So if what your, your function is, if it's a gradient of something, we say it's a conservative function. Now, how do you know if something is conservative? Well, there's a couple of ways. Um, if it's uh, something involving three variables, you look at the curl. But usually an even easier way is to say, I know if it's conservative if I can find f, that little f. Well, let's ask ourselves the question, is this conservative? So if it is conservative, this would have to be the derivative with respect to x. This would have to be the derivative with respect to y. OK, so can we come up with a function? Well, let's just eyeball it and see what we get. First off, if I integrated the first piece with respect to x, what would I get? The integral of 2xy is x squared y. Integral of 2x, with, remember we're integrating with respect to x, is x squared. Come to the next term. Integrate this with respect to y. Well, integral of x squared with respect to y, I treat x, x squared as a constant, it would be x squared y. I say, fantastic, I already got that. I'm good to go. Integral of e to the y with respect to y is e to the y. And I say, ugh, perfect. It works. And I can say, this is conservative. Here's the potential function. Here's that f. I know it's conservative, which means this integral is not an integral I do at all by doing integration. I, I do it essentially by finding the antiderivative, because that's more or less what you're doing. You're saying, aha, if this is the gradient of something, finding the something is finding the antiderivative. And now what do we do with that? So the answer is that the integral along the curve of 2xy plus 2x dx plus x squared plus e to the y dy is going to be equal to this function, x squared y plus x squared plus e to the y, evaluated at the start and the end. And you remember, you, you plug in the end, subtract, plug in the start. So we plug these numbers in. 1 plus 1 plus e minus 0 plus 0 plus 1, and we get 1 plus e. And we're done. How do you know if you're doing this kind of problem? Look for a weird curve that has a different start and a different end. If you have a curve in the plane that has a different start and a different end, or a curve in three dimensions, it doesn't matter, two or three dimensions, same philosophy, look to say, is this thing that I'm integrating 
a conservative function, and if it is, find that little f. You can find it either by eyeballing it or by working through a process, working through the partial derivatives one layer at a time. Okay, 22. Okay, here we go. Let f equal x squared minus 2y squared i plus 2y minus 2xyj, and c is the path along the semicircle. Let's draw this. It starts at 2, 0, ends at negative 2, 0, and I'm coming along this way. And then I move back along the x-axis. So here's my c. c is this curve. And you'll notice it's a closed curve. It's a closed curve in the plane. As soon as you see closed curve in the plane, what should you think? Green's theorem. Green's theorem is closed curve in the plane. Okay. So I'm going to start by saying, aha, I probably have a Green's theorem coming into play in some sense, some fashion. Okay, so here I see that obviously I'm in, in closing a nice region. So it wants us to find these integrals. Now, this first integral here, if I think of f as being mi plus nj, the f dot t is another way to write the integral along the curve of m dx plus n dy. So in terms of Green's theorem, what does this become? Green's theorem says this is the integral over the region of n sub x minus m sub y dA. So for us, that's the integral over the region of what? Well, n sub x, take the derivative of this piece with respect to x, and I'll get do, 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 minus 2y, then minus m sub y, so I come over here, if I take the derivative of this piece with respect to y, uh, I'll get the x squared drops out, and I'll get minus minus 4y, so minus minus 4y, and so what do I get? Is that uh, the dA? So I get that this is equal to the integral over the region, plus plus 4y minus 2y of 2y dA. Okay, so well, that's the integral we have to do. How, how could we actually do this integral? What, would, what tool would we use? Or what system? Polar. Because it's a nice semicircle. So we could, if we did this in polar, okay, integral, integral, 2, y becomes r sine theta, and I'm going to have r dr d theta, and then what happens? Well, theta goes 0 to pi, and r goes 0 to 2. Now, someone said, hey, can I pull these apart if, if my constants, if my bounds are all constant? Yes, yeah, we can. This is a nice example where you can pull these integrals apart. So this becomes integral 0 to pi sine of theta d theta, and the other one becomes integral 0 to 2 of 2r squared dr. Well, this one, not bad, integral of sine, negative cosine from 0 to pi, and if you work this out, you get 2. Here, you're going to get 2 thirds r cubed, and if you work that out from 0 to 2, you're going to get uh, 16 thirds, because you're going to get 2 times 8 over 3. And therefore, this turns out to be 32 thirds. All right, well, that's the integral of f dot t. Now, f dot n, f dot t, by the way, that's, that's the actual Green's theorem version. f dot n, now, that reminds us of something. That's really like the flow through the boundary. We say, okay, hold on, there was flow through the boundary, and the, the nice result was, if you're integrating flow through the boundary, that that's equal to the integral over your region of divergence. Okay, well, what's the divergence? Come to the first term. Derivative with respect to x is 2x. And I go to my second term. Derivative with respect to y 
is negative 2x. So what will that become? Well, integral over your region of 0, which is 0. So in this case, the net flow is 0. And the amount coming in equals the amount going out. And that's it. We're done. Okay. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I forgot the 2. Ah! There's a 2 there. So this is the integral over your region of 2. Sorry. Well, what is that? That's 2 times the integral over your region dA. You're right. Because with respect to y of 2, y is 2. Okay, well, let's not do a hard integral. Let's do an easy observation. What am I really finding if I'm integrating dA? Area. So this is the area of half a circle. Now, this is a circle radius 2. The full circle would have area pi r squared, which is 4 pi. So half of that is 2 pi. There we go. There we go. Yeah. I think I got that one right. Times 2, which is 4 pi. There we go. All right, I better put that away before. I told you, as a, as, you know, towards the end, it's going to get harder for me. So do, it's, it's not the worst idea in the world to sort of pick one or two hard ones and get those out of the way when you still have strength. Okay, 23. Suppose you have S, uh, X, Y, Z. It's all the points where x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to z, is less than or equal to 2 minus the square root of x squared plus y squared, and let g be the bounding surface of s with outward pointing normals, n. Find the integral on the bounding surface of f dot n d sigma, and this is notation. Sometimes I use d of s a. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's doing a surface integral. And where f is some crazy thing, uh, inverse tangent, that's another way of saying r tangent, if you're short on space. What kind of thing is S? What, what is this? Well, we'll start off the picture, but in particular, it's a solid. S is a solid. It's a shape. So you have this shape sitting in space, and you have a bounding surface to it. What tool works with solids? Gauss, divergence theorem. So when we see that we're dealing with some kind of solid shape, we're going to think Gauss's divergence theorem. Okay, so that's what we're thinking. And especially we're thinking that when it says, look, integrate on the boundary of your solid f dot n. Because that's what, exactly what Gauss's divergence theorem says. In fact, what Gauss's divergence theorem says says that, that that integral is equal to the triple integral over the solid of the divergence of f dv. Okay, well, so let's figure out what, what this will become. Uh, that's equal to the integral over our solid divergence of f. So, go through and take derivatives. Derivative of this with respect to x will give us 2z. Derivative of this with respect to y will give us 2yz. Okay, interesting. And the arc tangent disappears. It just is gone. Derivative of minus yz squared with respect to z, minus 2yz. And you'll notice here that we get a little bit of cancellation. So lo and behold, this problem really is about integrating over our solid of 2z dv. Once we realized that there was a divergence theorem, we applied the divergence theorem, we said, aha, this is what's really happening. We know what's really going on here. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we need to understand the shape. So let's talk about the shape. So what does this consist of? Well, it consists of a lower surface, which is z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. Well, that's a bowl. That's our Nice bowl down here sitting on the xy plane. Not a, not a hemisphere. Z, this is, this is an elliptic paraboloid. 2 minus square root of x squared plus y squared. Do we know what that would look like? If you just saw that, 
what would you say? Cone. Minus would do what? Turn it upside down. Tube does what? Pushes it up too. So it's a cone that's been moved up going down. So there's a, it's this shape where the bottom half comes from a, a pra elliptic paraboloid bowl. The top half comes from a cone. It's almost like you took your ice cream cone and turn it upside down. Okay. Now we actually have to integrate this because there's this beautiful rotational symmetry. Uh, we probably are thinking something like spherical or cylindrical. In our case, which one should we use? Cylindrical. We should probably avoid spherical because neither of these things are spheres. And in particular, x squared plus y squared equals z is really nice to describe in terms of cylindrical coordinates. The bottom curve is z equals r squared. The top curve is z equals 2 minus r. So what's going to happen here? Well, the only thing we'd like to know is where do they intersect? Well, when does 2 minus r equal r squared? That will be where they intersect. Now, you could rewrite this and solve and factor, but I think you can probably guess. Does anyone see the solution? That's right, r equals negative 2. No, 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 of course that's not right. Now, r equals negative 2 solves that, but, but we don't do negative r. So it must be the other root, which is 1. Okay, so what will this become? Integral, integral, integral. 2, z in cylindrical coordinates becomes z. dv becomes r dz dr d theta. Now theta goes 0 to pi because we go all the way around. r goes 0 to 1. Because if we were to look down the z-axis, we would see this curve this common intersection, that common intersection is at r equals 1. So that's what we would see, it's a unit circle. And then z goes from r squared to 2 minus r. And now away we go. So I can go ahead and just do the d theta, as I mentioned before, so 2 pi, integral 0 to 1. I'm integrating first with respect to z. That'll be r times z squared from z equals r squared to z equals 2 minus r dr, so that's 2 pi times integral 0 to 1 of r times 2 minus r squared minus r squared squared, or r to the fourth dr. So if we multiply that out, being very patient not to lose anything, that would be 4 times r, 4r, and the next term, if I multiply 2 minus r squared, the first term is 4, and I get minus 4r, then don't forget there's another r there, so minus 4r squared, and plus r squared times r, so plus r cubed, minus r to the fourth dr. So this will be 2 pi times 2r squared minus 4 thirds r cubed plus 1 fourth r to the fourth minus 1 fifth r to the fifth. Evaluate from 0 to 1. Which means what? Well, which means we plug in 0 and 1. Plug in 0, lots of zeros. Plug in 1, 2 pi, and we get 2 minus 4 thirds plus 1 fourth minus 1 fifth. Now we can get a common denominator here of, what is that, uh, 60. Okay, sure we can. So 2 pi times all over 60, so we get 120. Then we have minus 80. Uh, plus 15, and then minus 12. So 120 minus 80 is 40, plus 15 uh, minus 12, uh, that's 40 minus, uh, 40 plus 3, which is 43. Uh, of course, we can cancel that out, get a 30. So assuming I haven't done anything crazy, that's 43 pi 30 Oh, you're right. I did something crazy. Okay, so that makes that a 6. That makes that a 6, which means our common denominator isn't 60. It's what? 12. Oh, that's much nicer. Okay, so let's try this round 2. 2 pi, 24 
minus 16 plus 3 minus 2 over 12. Okay, the 2 goes in that, 6, 24 minus 16 is 8, plus 3 is 11, minus 2 is 9, so that's pi times 9 over 6. We can cancel off another 3, which gives us a final answer of 3 pi halves. Okay. Ha! Easy. Yes, but just be careful with your arithmetic. Don't, don't take three hours to take the test, is the moral of the story here, because you know, around that third hour, you really start winding down. And the other thing is, uh, we won't let you, so. Okay. 24! 24! Oh my gosh, I, uh, I gotta say, it's been a long time. You stuck it out, we're finishing it up. You know, you, you got calculus problems, I feel bad for you. I got 24 problems and the last one is fun, so here we go. We have this f, negative 2yi plus 2xj plus xy plus z squared k. S is this surface, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9 with z greater than or equal to 0. Now notice it says the surface is the top half of a hemisphere. It has a surface, there's an edge. There's an edge here. So this is a surface with an edge. The normals point up. Okay, so here we go. The fact that we have a surface with an edge tells us what? Stokes. If you see a surface with an edge, or if you see just a closed curve in 3D, that's Stokes. So that's the two things to look for, a surface with an edge or a closed curve. Now, that's the surface they gave us. I don't like that surface. It's complicated. It's way more complicated than it needs to be. Let's change it. Are we allowed? Yes, as long as we keep the boundary the same. Because it's that closed curve that's dictating what happens. That's the Stokes theorem. So, what's a nice curve that has the same boundary? The answer is a disk. So we're just going to put a disk there. Now, if I put a disk, my normals are still going to point up. What does my normal become? 0, 0, 1. Becomes super clean. Now Stokes' theorem says, I want to integrate s of del cross f dot n. Well, that's what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to use that surface. I'm going to use that surface. In other words, not the big blister, the anti-blister after you've popped it and made it go flat. Have you never done this before? <laughs> I mean, sorry, I've been standing here for three hours. That's, that's, my, that's my thought process right now. Okay, so what do we need? Well, we need del cross f. So del cross f, that's going to be what? Okay, i, j, k, partial, partial x, partial, partial y, partial, partial z, and uh, minus 2y, 2x, xy plus z squared. Okay, now we know in the end we're going to dot it with 0, 0, 1. So we're going to do what? Well, let's do cofactor expansion. Uh, well, no, we'll go ahead and do work it out. Uh, I partial partial y, xy plus z squared. That's going to be xi, j partial partial z of minus 2i, 0j, k partial partial x of 2x, 2k. Then we're going to have partial partial y minus 2i times k. But because I'm going down, I, I really subtract negative 2k, which adds another 2k j partial partial x of xy plus z squared, which becomes minus y, j, uh, and i partial partial z of 2x is 0, 0 i subtract, so we get x minus y, 4. So, lo and behold, we're asked to find the integral over our new surface, I'll just go up to the next letter of the alphabet, t, of x negative y, 4, the curl, dot, 0, 0, 1, d sigma. Well, this simplifies to be 4. So that's the integral over the surface of 4. Well, the 4 comes out. What does this find, the integral of d sigma? Finding the surface area. Well, the surface area of a really flat thing. In particular, it's the surface area, and this corresponds to a circle of radius what? 
3. What's the area of a circle of radius 3? Area is 9 pi. 36 pi. Done. Done. Okay. 24 problems. If you can understand the ideas that we talked about today, you'll be in great shape. I, I promise you, I didn't just pick these randomly. I checked with the person who wrote the test before I did that. So study these problems, and then if you have time, study more. The more problems you do, the more you practice, the better you'll be. And thanks for waiting so long and being so patient. Have a good day.